Okay, team. We should be good to go. And there's only about five people. Now, this worries me quite a lot um, because there are people... Uh, they, they're still trying to find her. Okay. I tried in the message to say where Masushi is, but I just realized that that door might not be open. I can go. I, that, that, the message that I sent through should have gone and sent an email as well. If it didn't, if it didn't, I'm going to try and send one now. Um, I'll just see it now, see, because particularly those that have got the thing on um, popped up. Going to try. So, uh, guys, so if anybody's listening here on the live stream, um, we, we've just had a change of bill of room to um, 032, uh, sorry, 132010. It's the Education Central building with, um, with Miss Sushi. So, I'm going to uh, uh, just on my machine here quickly send a message out and see whether or not this will send us an email. I'm hoping it will do. All right. Hi, all. There is a change of room to 132.010 um, Education Central next to Miss Sushi. Um, the door closest. Oh, does that door, can someone just grab that? If, is that all right? Can you open that door? That's, if it's locked? Thanks. Thank you. Closest. All right, guys, so that is sending now. It should send an email as well. So apologies for that in advance. Everybody, there's always going to be. That's all right, we're not going to run. But not, even though the, so the stream's going at the moment, you can jump on the chat if you need to, but there's, there's not going to be. We're not going to start the content for a, a couple of minutes. Oops, turn it off. Okay, team. So that should be should be rocking and rolling around about now. So I said, told you that I actually only got a um, the notification just recently, just off oh, like four o'clock or something thereabouts that the thing had come through, even though I'd applied two weeks ago. But that's, sorry about that. Okay, so um, without any more ado. Uh, we probably can kick off now. Um, I'm just, just a bit of background and preliminary stuff at the start here. This um, topic is on is the first of five weeks on contract law, and it's really important. It's just a really important area of law, commercial law, and relevant uh, and just in terms of business transactions. I'll grab a seat. Um, sitting a little bit lower. Um, and so because we're in a larger room, I'm going to run the talky bits a bit more like a regular session. I still do have some uh, materials which I'll hand out. There's a roll here as well. Uh, so we will be going over these. Um, so it's still, it's still going to be something of a mixture of a, of a hybrid um, seminar as opposed to lecture. But um, you know, by and large, just in the bigger space, look, it's a little bit more comfortable. It's got better air conditioning, and everyone has more space. And oh, okay, thank you, thanks for that. Um, I wonder if we can jig, leave those doors there open. Um, I expected there would be teething problems, which is why I'm not going to talk too much at the very start. So apologies if there's anyone on the video. Um, it's really just background stuff at this stage. Um, I made the point about um, about contract law being. Uh, key to commerce and something that flowed from uh, the British common law. Good luck, guys. Oh. Uh, yeah. It's um, we're just doing background stuff at the moment. There's nothing, nobody's missed anything. And um, so because it, it is so central to commerce and because the rules were developed by judges rather than codified, uh, this part can be a little bit challenging, particularly for those coming from what I call sort of the code jurisdictions, uh, places where the laws have been taken and all written down ahead of time. 
not to say that that style of law is wrong or different or better or worse. Um, each of them has problems. Is that someone there as well? But the, for this particular subject, at least for the first four weeks, we're going to be concentrating on the, um, on the common law rules. Now, I get asked a lot about this, and we might have to jimmy that door open too. I think what I might do, I'm just going to go open this door, guys. Just be a second. Back again. <laughs> yeah, it was always going to be a little interrupted, this. Uh, like I said, I only found out at 4 o'clock that the room had changed. Um, so I said, apologize to you guys. We haven't really talked about much yet. All I'm saying for this early bit is that this subject, or this, it's about half of everything we do, a uh, third to half of what we do is on contract, and these ones, one, two, three, four, in fact, I'll wiggle it on this, this thing here. One, two, three, four, are all based in the common law. So this, uh, this week, the se seminar, the session, and this week's material is based on the formation, the creation of contracts. Uh, next week is going to be t uh, terms. It's going to be analyzing once you have a valid contract, what does that mean? What do the actual promises or um, obligations that we have under it entail. And it's really going to be an analysis of that, and particular types of terms as well, uh, things like exclusion clauses and onerous terms. We're going to look at that, and we'll look at things like the effect of signature as well uh, in terms of formation. Uh, then a week after that, we're going to look at um, vitiating factors. Those are um, points of law that we can argue where on the face of it, it looks like we have a valid agreement, a valid contract, but there's some form of defect. Now, the defect might mean we can undo the contract and say that there is no contract and seek remedies and all that way, or it might give us some other option, some other sort of remedy in the law. Um, but that, on its own, is quite complex, and so we analyze that for a significant length of time as well. Um, after that, that fourth one is an arguably the most important. It's uh, discharge. So how do contractual obligations end? And what happens? What happens next? If our obligations have ceased, either because the contract exists or it's been discharged in some way, um, have the sides done what they said they're going to do? And if they haven't, what are the consequences? And in particular, what you know, the folding stuff. What's the money consequences of what we call damages. How is the cost of people breaching contracts uh, allocated to parties? Um, so that's a pretty, uh, that's, as you said, is arguably the most important, um, probably the lecture in the whole, um, the whole, whole subject. Uh, and then finally, the fifth week we do this is the statutory. So the, all of these four formation terms, vitiating factors, discharge, they've been developed by the courts. Uh, the courts of ye old England, um, and the, you know, the British have gone through, and when a particular novel set of circumstances has come up, senior judges in that system, and later in Australia as well, have said, this is how contracts work. These are the rules. And whenever something else would come up later on, a bunch of judges would say, would map out an area as well to explain it. Um, however, in some situations, and particularly in the 20th century, that was, just became manifestly inadequate. Um, you found that a lot of contracts, ordinary agreements that people would have, you really just can't go to the courts if somebody rips you off over a you know, $50 packet of cigarettes or if somebody um, does something to you in regards to certain types of contracts, land being a big one. 
Um, but uh, here we look at the Sale of Goods Act and how that's codified in things, as well as the Australian Consumer Law. It's where parliaments jumped in and said, look, we need to map this out ahead of time for a bunch of these things. And so that, that, those um, statutory modifications, that, that we take a full week going through and talking about those. The key thing to note is that you don't start with that. In, in this system, you start with the fundamental rules which come from these old common law cases. Those are the principles of law. It's not till later on that statutory frameworks are put on top. And then you have to interpret these basic rules in light of these changes to things. As I said, um, buying and selling things like real estate or motor vehicles, employment law, um, the rules governing the contracts between employee and employer, things like that, um, where we recognize that there are massive power imbalances and difficulties using the um, quite complex uh, systems. So I'll start off with just a basic definition. Um, as you guys have probably realized from, um, from, well, from, from the subject, the, that I can give here my thoughts. If you rent one textbook, they're going to explain it a slightly different way. Another might use slightly different language. I had a tutorial early today teaching stage one contract law to the first year law students. And um, I had to explain to them something of a difficult dynamic uh, that comes up for, particularly for, for law students, people going and learning, learning and studying law, learning how to jump through hoops and replicate work to get good quality pieces. All right, but avoiding plagiarism. It's a really difficult balancing act because in law and in the legal system, um, judges, when they give judgments, try very, very carefully to make sure they are saying the same thing as earlier judgments, as earlier cases, as best they can. Um, there's no system of plagiarism. In fact, it is the norm. It is what is expected to try and use and reuse existing principles the rules that have been expounded by earlier judges in your own judgments. Why do they do that? So they don't get appealed. As judges try not to write and do judgments where the parties are just going to go off and be appealed anyway. It just means they're doing their job badly. If you're a judge and everything you do and say gets appealed and the other side wins on appeal and then it has to go back, or usually to a different judge, you're doing your job badly and it reflects poorly on you um, as a result. And so, yeah, um, this, I think, is the, probably the most basic, um, what do we got, six words? Yeah, six words that we used to describe that. The, the key aspect of it is that it's an agreement. Agreement's the superset, contract's the subset. Not all agreements are contracts. All contracts are agreements. Um, just that contracts have consequences. They have legal consequences. You can enforce them in the courts. All right, do contracts have to be in writing? I reckons yes. Yes. Yes, I reckons no. No, can be, it can be either or. Some contracts can be oral, some contracts can be written. Um, you can have a mix between the two. And there's some problems with that too as well, which I'll get to uh, next week. Um, and some can actually be, what they say, implied. In other words, that through, usually through a course of dealings between parties, uh, particularly where they're doing things routinely. They have one contract where one side, um, you know, a long time ago, signed a, perhaps signed a document that said, all right, I will buy 50 things of um, boxes of your product and pay you $1,000, all right? And that could just be implied. And they could have just carried on doing this. And what you can find is that over a period of time, um, somebody may just turn around and say, hang on, you've just delivered this box. We didn't ask for this. Is there a contract here? We didn't ask for this box. And the fact that, you, that they've been delivering it for the last two and a half years and you've been paying a week later for the past two and a half years, even though each contract in theory was individual, maybe you reached this point. It was like, well, there's no paperwork for this. What? There's no contract here. Well, not really. The courts are actually happy to say that, look, through the conduct of the parties, even though we didn't have this particular meeting of minds in that case, it can actually be implied um, as a result. So... So just make note that the, the, the key takeaway from this, not all contracts have to be in writing. Sorry, some contracts do. Some contracts must be in writing. The most important one of these is contracts for the sale of land. 
Um, there's a phrase that Steve uses in his, oh, his textbook, which you guys have for this subject, um, that refers to an old piece of legislation passed, I think, by Henry VIII, around about that time, in the 1500s. Might have been Queen Elizabeth, actually, maybe past that. Yeah, it's around about that sort of era anyway. It's called the Statute of Frauds. And the Statute of Frauds, some of the key provisions these days exist in uh, Section 11 of the Property Law Act. It's very, very short. You can probably just Google it and read it if you want to. And it just says certain types of contracts have to be in writing. Contracts for the sale of land must be in writing. Insurance contracts must be in writing. And guarantees um, that people make must be in writing. Those must be in writing in order to be enforced. And I believe last week I'd mentioned to you guys about um, that I'd had a contract for the sale of land involving my uh, my ex-partner. And that thing that we talked about, this area of law known as equity. Because if you, in theory, if you pay for something, half each, but it's in one person's name, legally, so at law, they own it. They have the right to do all of the things involving property in regards to that. But we appreciate in our legal system that people don't usually buy houses for other people. So there are extra rules that go with that. And we'll talk about the, these rules involving the area of law known as equity later as well. Okay. How can a contract be oral? Contract be oral. I will sell you my boat for, if you, I, I wish to sell you my boat for $500 and you say yes. We shake hands, I give you the money. Yeah, hang on, I give you the boat, you give him the money, we walk away. You can, you certainly can. It's still a contract, provided well, we have. Say, I gave them the money. Um, okay, one thing you find, and it comes up a lot with law and legal stuff, is that um, there are rules of evidence. And so the key takeaway from that, by the way, it's a really important point. Contracts can be oral or written, but writing is the best form of evidence. Yeah. So if you go to court, you, assuming you're the party that's been ripped off here, yeah. you want to sue them for breach of contract, you have to adduce evidence in the form of a sworn statement, usually that you have. Hey, we met at this time. I said, um, person offered me the boat for this amount of money. I said, yes, I gave him the money. He never gave me the boat. Your Honor, I would like judgment in my favor. That, um, that's essentially how it works. But it's a pain because it's so much easier for you to rock up and say, I gave this person the money. This is the written agreement we had. This person didn't perform at this time. I don't have a boat. It's much easier to do that because it doesn't turn into a he said, she said situation where you're having to argue. Uh, don't get me wrong, it does happen. Judges do have to rule all of the time where people have done things, gentlemen's agreements. And, and so part of what we're gonna do and talk about right now is this distinguishing from agreements and contracts, things that are contracts and things that aren't. Because if you think about it, how many times have you made a bet with one of your siblings? Bet you $50, you can't jump over that car while it's doing over 40 k's an hour. Um, assuming that you go and do that outrageously silly stunt, do they have to pay you? Yeah. You would think so, because on the face of it, it's a contract, we have agreement, we've exchanged consideration. Sadly, in the context of family relations, one of the elements here is not going to be satisfied by default. Okay, so the, the key thing to note from this, all seven of these things have to be established in order for you to have a contract. All right, so in the case of um, having the bet with your younger brother for them to do some, you know, some, some stunt, some, you know, jump, jump between these two buildings. All right, I'll give you $50 if you do do it. Um, just on the face of it here, uh, there's an offer. I've offered something, um, or I've offered a clear statement of, of terms of how this is gonna, um, gonna happen. They've unequivocally accepted it without modification. Consideration has happened. You do the jump, I give you $50. That's the stuff, that's the subject matter. Um, intention I'll come back to, because that's the problem. Um, capacity, assuming your brother and you are not minors. Sui juris, you're not under some disability. You're going to have legal capacity to contract. You have a mutual understanding of the subject matter. Um, the last one might be problematic too, because contracts on the face of it have to be lawful as well. Contracts uh, 
Contracts have to be lawful. You can't have a contract to kill somebody. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't satisfy that. Now, legality is a little bit of a. Yeah. That's right. Now, strictly speaking, I mean, legality we talk about here as an element, and a couple of weeks' time I'll talk about it as a vitiating factor as well. Legality is, is actually pretty complex um, because a lot of things can be when contract to kill somebody is pretty obviously unlawful, but a lot of things you can do in business, um, you can do things in certain ways that can be problematic, can be problematic, particularly in how they're performed. So if I give you a contract, for example, um, can you deliver uh, this, um, this box of goods or this telephone? Can you drive to Brisbane for that? I'll give you $3,000 if you drive this to Brisbane, all right? And, and you've got a day to do it, okay? What if, but if I say to you, take this to, you know, drive this to Brisbane, you have to drive, but you've got 12 hours to do it. What's the problem there? Oh, I mean, it's possible to do it. You just have to drive way over the speed limit in order to do that. So it's arguably, it, it, and this is the thing the courts are sometimes faced with, where contracts on the face of it satisfy the legality thing there, and on the surface of it, now this is legal. It's only a contract for transport. There's nothing, there's no narcotics in there, not an offense in itself for me. The but the performance, the performance of it, necessarily entails it being performed in an illegal way. So we will analyze that more, but we actually do it under vitiating factors, not so much under the, um, uh, the elements here. Because you've got to have these, these things on the face of it have to be satisfied. And you could imagine, we're going to go through some rules about each of them, and then we're going to go to some sort of some sub rules or some exceptions to those rules. It's the way law sort of works. You have a high level rule, then some sub rules and sub sub rules and so on and so on. Okay. Um, but the key thing to note here, you must have all seven. Um, the word elements, it's a bit of a legal technical term to mean uh, a series of points that need to be proved in order to win, in order to win something. Here, sometimes it's a cause of action. In other words, I bring an action um, against you. Um, look, 99% of the time in contract law, the elements aren't in dispute. And so from after this week, at this, when we're analyzing contracts, I'm just going to say, assume all seven elements are satisfied. Um, because 99% of the time, when people go to court, it's not about these. Usually these aren't problematic. It's usually other features. Terms, and in particular, the stuff from the fourth week of contract law, which is discharge, breach. People not doing what they said they're going to do. That's the main one um, that comes up. These ones, and it's, so it becomes a little bit of an academic task, but you need to know it because it's the, it's the building blocks in which we're analyzing um, uh, contracts. All right, so um, the way that I structure these, these things is that there's a, a series of statements of law and some sources of where they come from, um, some sources of, of legal principle. And so that for your guy's perspective, if you're explaining a particular rule and giving a source, these ones are going to be fine. Um, or in, if you're going through your textbook and you find things that are um, uh, that are like a similar case, perhaps even a better case. Um, sorry, guys, my computer has just literally come up to me and asked to do an update. Okay, please don't update right now. Okay. All right. And so this idea of an offer, this is really the first step when we're looking at a contract. Um, when we offer something, we're promising to do something in exchange for somebody else promising to do something. Okay, and we call that the thing, the promises, we call those uh, that the consideration each side offers. Um, but the, and this is again, it's a little annoying for those with English as a second language. Um, it's used sometimes as a verb, I offer to you, but we also use it as a noun, the offer. The offer was this, this, and this. Okay, so just just make note. Doesn't really make. Um, sometimes this um, the word offer is used as a verb. Um, I offer to you to do this, this, and this. Um, or we can refer to it as a noun. The offer, the offer that's made. Hey, look, we've received. Oh, it depends what the sentence structure is. Um, if I am making an offer. That's a noun. 
it's, it's an offer. If I offer, that's a verb. Yeah, it's a verb. Look, it doesn't. It's not a particularly um, important thing here. The key thing to note are these bits. This um, this clear statement of terms. The terms are the list of promises. And the list of promises that the offeror makes includes the things that they're going to do and the things they want the other side to do. Yeah. Okay, that's the, just the, the, the key aspect here. It has to be clear. It can't be vague. And it has to include everything I'm going to do and everything you're going to do. Okay? But, um, that's really the starting point in this. The starting point of this area um, of law. So if you guys are doing your MBA and MPA, we're doing uh, the business law subject, we're doing contract law in particular, and the contractual offer. Starting point here, and the, when you offer something, must be clear. It's got to be a, a statement of all of the promises. My promises and your promises. All right? Um, coupled with all the other intentions too. So intention and consideration, legality, mutuality, but we'll get to those in a second. Um, the key thing to note, these are the things, the list of promises, the terms, that I want us to both be bound by. All right. So that's, that's the starting point. That's what an offer is. And there are some exceptions to this because offers, while they can be made to one other person, they can also be made to the world at large. Okay, and now is where we start to delve, some people think it's fun, some people think it's really annoying, into the sources of these rules and principles. I'll start with quite a, well, quite a famous case in contract law. It's called Carlisle and Carbolic Smoke Ball Company. With these cases, and all the cases I'll talk about, I'll, I'll talk about the facts, all right? but the facts themselves aren't relevant, at least not so much other than an interesting piece of information. It's the rules and principles that flow from it. It's what the judges actually said um, in that case and why it's important. That's the bit, the takeaway I want you guys to remember. So it can be a little bit disjointed because I'm going to be talking about this person doing this and this person doing that, and they've gone off and lived their lives over 100 years ago. Um, but this is just the way that, um, that contracts are made in our system and contract law is made and developed in the common law system. So in uh, the early 1890s, um, uh, there, was a, um, there was a global pandemic going around, a little bit topical, and it was influenza. So there was a flu virus that was going around killing vast swathes of the world. There was one in, I think, 1890, 89, 90. Um, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just realized it's actually quite topical, isn't it? Um, and this company put an ad out in the paper. And it's really kind of unusual that um, this, this particular ad, because they said 100 pound reward for anyone that buys our product, which were called carbolic smoke balls, and catches influenza. So if an offer to the world, come buy our product, use it, and if you do, we will give you 100 pounds, which if you appreciate, 100 pounds in the UK in the year 18, you know, early 1890s, it's a huge sum of money. That's, oh, it's huge. It's, um, Try telling your friends you're going to give them 100 pounds. Yeah, yeah, I know now. Um, but uh, it would be the equivalent of about somewhere between 15 and $20,000. So you're talking a non-trivial sum of money. The sort of thing you'd, you'd go to court for. Yeah. And this woman did. So she bought the product. She used it. She got the flu. And she was like, oh, I would like to claim my 100 pounds, please. And, um, and so the, uh, it went all the way to the House of Lords. And they had a bit of a discussion about this. And one of the interesting things, and why this is important to start with, is that they talked a lot about a variety of legal rules and principles involving contract law. And the first one we want to talk about here is, is this a contractual offer 
to the world at large. That phrase, the word, in other words, is this an offer that anyone can accept by performing their side of it? Right? Because the the carbolic smoke ball company tried desperately to argue, oh no, 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 no. That's definitely not how this should be characterized. Contracts have to be made between two people. And the court said, no, no, they don't. Usually contracts are designed for a particular series of rule of, of terms unequivocal um, an offer is made as a series of terms that I wish to agree contractually bound on that I give to another party and they go um, and maybe accept or maybe don't but you can also have offers to the world at large and in the case of carbolic smoke ball that's exactly what happened is this just starting it's out of the analysis. Um, it's really to do with formation, a lot of this stuff. Because a couple of things they also said when analyzing the ad, because the real problem was the ad. You got, and look, some of the, 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 um, some of the facts and some of the rules that come from this are actually things today that you ought to be aware of in business. You ought to be aware of this because you can put an ad out that is a contractual offer. You can do this. You don't want to be doing this most of the time. And the carbolic smoke ball company thought that they weren't doing that. They do a lot of guaranteed money back. Oh, oh, oh yeah. They, they, they do. It's guaranteed money back. Usually, though, they'll say to accept that, you've got to do a certain bunch of things. Guaranteed money back if you go and buy this product and fill in a form and then wait a length of time. And those businesses work knowing that only some fraction of people are going to bother jump through those hoops to go through and do it. Yeah, they're... Uh, but we'll actually, I'll probably talk about them in week, the fifth week. Um, yeah, it can. But if you think about it, though, an offer that goes to the world has to be conveyed to the world. So it often is through advertising and marketing um, in some form. You have to somehow communicate this, whether you do it through social media, whether you do it in this case by placing a big newspaper ad um, in one of the big papers, um, whether you run around yelling it out to people. Um, all of those things are, are broadcasting and um, in some ways you could argue advertising. Doesn't, strictly speaking, have to be through a formal media. So if there is a politician yep. that, so I'll give you the incident um, that just happened recently in Lebanon, there's been a lot of riots. And sure. So the president came up and said something around the lines of, I'm going to be doing one, two, three, four, and it's possible for your, for your, for your country, our yep. country, yep. and if yep. someone is not satisfied with it, yep. I will resign. Okay. Is this a verbal contract? Contract? Okay, so the question is, only because I have to just repeat it back into the mic for the yeah. externals in the recording. The question is, um, if the president of a country comes up with a list of promises that she or he um, says they're going to do, and if they don't, they say they're going to resign, um, is that a contract? The answer is no, sadly, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is the going back to the elements, the intention to be legally bound is one. Two is consideration. What are the people giving back? What are they doing? Their votes? Maybe. Make a maybe an argument. But if the person just says this unilaterally, the other side aren't offering anything. Um, thirdly, often you find political figures um, have particular statutory frameworks that gives them immunity. Um, so here, for example, in um, Queensland and in the federal parliament, anything you say inside parliament is governed by what's called parliamentary privilege. No cause of action arises around, both in defamation or contract law. Okay, so that's um. So in terms of those, no, no, it's not going to work out. It doesn't have um, the la the necessary um, cer uh, commercial certainty as well uh, as part and parcel of that. But there's so there's a couple of defects with that. Um, that particular area, um, you might also find the court systems prevented from suing the president as well in some some jurisdictions. England being one of them. Queen can't be sued. Queen, can be Queen, sued. Queen can't be sued. Yeah. No. Um, if you think about it, remember when we have um, look criminal matters and it has R and a little V, you know, so it's the Queen against Smith. So it's the Queen, in theory, bringing the action. So the Queen herself, the Queen of, Aust Queen of Australia, Elizabeth Windsor, can't be sued, in theory, anyway. No one's ever put it to the... Um, to the test, why? Because it's probably treason. 
we'll yeah revisit that in another subject. Um, so what happened in the smoke wall company? Well, the trouble was, and this is an important one in terms of advertising. They had said in their ad, we have taken a thousand pounds and put it into a bank deposit box to pay out any of these claims for a hundred pounds for people that buy our product and still get the flu. Now, if we think about this, if they had made an outlandish claim, that's what's called puff. But because it was actually kind of believable, it, um, the so court they said, said, they said a million dollars, yeah, they said a million pounds, it would have been considered puff. It's actually the fourth um, part of this. I'll return to the others in a second. This idea of a, a statement or claim which is so exaggerated that no reasonable person would ever consider it to have any legal impact or effect. And the famous case of this, this is an American case. This is not binding at all, but it's, it's good because it's kind of funny and it's very memorable. There's an ad, you can Google it if you want to. Um, Pepsi ran an ad in the mid 90s that said, if you collect Pepsi bottle tops, right? You collect those bottle tops and you collect a hundred of them, you can pay a small fee and we'll give you a Pepsi bag. If you collect a thousand of them, pay a small fee, handling fee, we'll give you some sunglasses, you, you know, 4,000 of these bottle tops and we'll give you a bomber jacket, an aviator jacket. And you collect 100,000 of those, or some amount, it was, yeah, I think it might have been 100,000, and we'll give you a Harrier jet. And so the ad is of, of this kid looking out his window and going, wow, and this Harrier jet's landing outside and the wind's going shh like this. What was the problem with this? I know it is outrageous, but is not it's not clear. Yeah, I, I think so too. It's it's a little bit. Um, oh, I don't know actually. Get a hundred thousand bottle bottle caps, and this is the real problem that Pepsi had. If you get a hundred thousand bottle caps, I think hundred thousand might have been maybe a little bit more. Might have been two or three hundred thousand bottle caps. So that's you know three hundred thousand bottles of Pepsi. All right. If you get three hundred thousand bottle bottles of Pepsi, all right. Can you get a Harrier jet? And so what happened? A young kid actually managed to convince a venture, an equity company, to lend him enough money to open uh, whatever it was. I can't remember the exact number, like 200,000 bottles of Pepsi, collect the bottle tap, and ask Pepsi for the Harrier jet. This went to the Second Circuit Federal Court of Appeal in the United States. They had to rule on this. Um, and curiously, when Pepsi became aware of this, they didn't pull the ad, didn't pull the ad, this is important, but they changed the number of bottle caps and put a few decimal points in there. So it was 20 million bottle caps, not 200,000 while they were going through this litigation. Um, and so the guy actually lost, Pepsi actually won um, in that. But in the end, I think, I think they might have settled it. The Pepsi just gave them a sum of money uh, before the thing actually went. But the judge had gone and issued and said that, look, yeah, um, it probably isn't reasonable to think that, that, that um, military jets, this is the, the key thing, military are going to form part of a commercial, a consumer contract. All right, which is interesting. Not that we thought it was too outrageous. It could have been a plane. If they wanted to, they could have had a Cessna. Um, but military jets, you can't buy on the open market. Oh yeah, 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 there's those things. Yeah, those things there. There's a lot of statutory frameworks. And again, we have to be mindful when doing contract law. So the question is that the statutory frameworks, the governance, there are. There's advertising um, things, there's consumer contracts. Certainly there's um, you know, the supply of military hardware um, legislation. Um, there's a lot of things that impact this. Um, so we're starting here with sort of first principle stuff. These are the basic laws. That's why these cases are always a little bit old when you go through and look at them. They're old, a lot of them are English. They're things that people use as the starting point. And a lot of them have been revisited in, um, in Australia, in Queensland in particular, where they've talked about and affirmed it in Australia. I don't put them in here. It's just a bit of unnecessary fluff. Um, I think it's handy to start with the starting points. Also because a lot of these cases are quite easy to read. Um, if you do, do want to go and have a look. So the, the next point I just want to make about, um, about contractual offers, though, is that um, uh, when you walk into a store and there's a price tag, is that a contractual offer? Can I just walk up to the counter and say, here's 
the um, $150 for this um, you know, iPhone, latest model iPhone. Say 100 and, I don't know how much they are, let's say $80. Hey look, $80 price tag for this, um, for a brand new iPhone. Here's my $80, the product, and walk out the door. All right? Just starting from these principles here, if that price tag is an offer, and I walk to the counter and give the $80, in other words, I'm demonstrating that I'm accepting it, would that be a contract? Yeah. It would be, it would be, yeah. if that was an offer. What the court said in this um, Pharmaceutical Society and Boots Case Council, which is the Boots case, in Boots, they said, um, look, uh, and this is oh, 50s, 60s, 50s, this was a time where um, self-serve stores started to become a thing. It was a newfangled thing. People, if you appreciate this, in the olden days, you don't walk into a store, pick the thing up and take it to the counter. It's, it's just, it seems crazy to us, but then also it seems crazy to people from 20 years ago, the idea that you would walk to a self-serve checkout and scan it yourself and then use a card that doesn't have a PIN number to pay. We stop and think about how crazy that sounds to our parents. That were their generation. If you ask them when they were our age, they'd say that's nuts. Well, if you ask their parents or their parents' parents the idea of walking into a store and walking up to a cashier and offering their goods, that seems crazy to them. What's to stop them putting it under their shirt and, and you know, running off and all of these things? Um, anybody here done um, much sort of IT uh, training? Any forms of IT, IT qualifications or any um, IT stuff? Because the, one of the contemporary themes of, of IT is about trust the building of trust networks. And we know, putting our auditing hats on, that if entities trust each other more, it lowers the risk profile between them. Things are less risky if parties trust each other more. Transaction costs are lower, commerce is better, is flows better, and interest rates can be lower because you don't need, you're not taking as, as much of a risky investment when you're going and doing things. So that, that's something to just, just make note. When there is more trust, Commerce runs more smoothly, and as a result, the transaction costs and the interest rates are lower. That's something, again, for you, particularly you guys doing auditing, where you have to work out risk um, and financial, well, anything in financial accounting, where you've got to, you've got to literally put a dollar uh, value on risk. These systems, though, of trust didn't just pop out of the blue. We didn't you know, um, have these ancient agrarian societies and start to trust our neighbors. Didn't. It took a really long time. And so when these newfangled self-serve stores, where you pick the thing up, people tried this on. And they tried to argue, um, in this case, at, at pharmacies, um, which is what this case involves, um, that when you picked up drugs and you went to the counter and you offered to pay, or sorry, you went to pay, that was accepting the offer. And the court said, no. No, it's not. It's really important. A price tag is not an offer is what's called an invitation to treat. And that's different and distinct from an offer. It's just designed to entice people in to the store or entice them to pick the goods up and take them to the counter for them to make an offer. We don't want people to be able to pick any old drugs off the, off the shelf, walk to the front, throw the money at the cashier and walk out. All right, and it's not. Unfortunately, the way contract law works reinforces that. Um, similarly with Fisher and Bell, that's a switch knife, um, a blade that's in a shop window, and a person said, saw the amount, saw that it was cheap, walked in, $10, went to walk out, and they said, no, 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 it's been mispriced. So if we stop and think about that for a second, when you walk into a store, clothing store, or again, the iPhone, which is, is, um, which is $89 instead of $890, it's been mispriced. What happens when you go to the cashier? They turn around and say no. Yeah, they say, yeah, if you want it, it's $890. They do not have to sell you for that amount. Now, one small caveat, and I can't slag off IGA over there anymore because I, I spent all of the last two, uh, many years of, of teaching the subject and the prior um, business law subject. The IGA over at... Um, uh, it, uh, what's the JCU um, clinical practice building. Why? Because stuff there would be mispriced all the time. 
Like, I literally would go through, I remember grabbing like six items and four of them were mispriced. Almost never were they mispriced to the favor of the consumer. Almost never, all right? And I wanted to see whether or not I could use the statutory framework, because in theory, under the common law rules, what price, if I say that this is this says $3 on the shelf and it says $5 here, what can they say? Too bad, it's $5. Under the statutory framework, I went to see whether or not that's a thing. It turns out mm, they're probably okay to still say that's $5 if it's a genuine, it's just a genuine mistake. However, you may or may not know this. Has anyone been to Coles or Woolworths and seen something that's mispriced? You haven't ever had that? Doesn't happen much. They've got much better at doing it because they have a code of conduct that says if something's mispriced, you get it at the lower price. In fact, I think some of them might even say you even get the item free. Some of them, you, you can get some. They, they're very, very, very consumer friendly. Um, they can do that because they don't get the prices wrong very often. Um, but either way, I said, I'm not sure whether you get it free these days, but I think it is you definitely get it at the lower price regardless of what the mistake price is. If it's two cents, too bad. You get it for two cents. But that is a voluntary code. And turns out, with a bit of research, IGA didn't sign up to that. So IGA... If you see something that's mispriced and you go to the counter, you cannot demand of them to sell it to you at that lower price, right? Because they're not part of the same system as the other two big supermarkets. Put that on the back of your mind. Okay. All right. A um, couple of other things I'll say about offers. So what about the same price of offers? Like if, if uh, someone keeps doing, keeps doing it? If you're doing it a lot, it's probably misleading and deceptive. It's an unfair trade practice. When we do the statutory um, uh, system of the Australian consumer law, we will talk about that. Unfair trade practices, because that is. Um, it's, it's misleading or deceptive. Um, but it's, strictly speaking, it's fine for the basic contract law co of rules of offer and acceptance. Okay, a couple of other things to note. Um, I had a bit of argument about this in the... Um, in the, in, the, in the law class uh, about this one, because the UK position and the Queensland position is different. It's actually a little bit annoying because um, the auctioneer's rules sit over the top of this as well. So when I say, strictly speaking at common law, for an old, this is from an old case, when you go to an auction, you're making an offer. When the hammer falls, they've accepted that offer. Um, that's the... Yeah, that's right. Again, it's governed. There are auctioneers' rules as well, so there are some rules that they can go through and do it. But um, they have to tell you under their own rules if there is a, a reserve, because if you, if there is a reserve and it's and you bid less than the reserve, they can back out of it. But that's governed by their, their statutory framework. By default, when you go to an auction, you're making a bid. That is an offer. I am offering a sum of money for the thing that is being bid on, and the auctioneer can choose to accept it or reject it. Um, a call for bids, in other words, the auctioneer going and asking for bids is not an offer. All right, so if the auctioneer goes and says something along the lines of any bids, any bids, no bids, no bids, all right, this is gonna pass in if there's no bids. If one person puts a bid on, um, that's not accepting. They are not accepting the auctioneer's call for bids they are still making an offer. Okay? Auctioneers asking for people to bid, or as the case of this Blackpool and uh, oh, Blackpool Council, a call for tenders. Do you guys know what tenders are? So it's not, it doesn't come up much in the English language. It's the idea that you're essentially bidding on something blind. So, and this happens for large things. Government contracts, and here this was for a council, it's for an airport. Um, and the, in, the, in this case, it had to go. To, uh, to court to resolve it. Why? Because there were some procedural errors here. If, uh, as in this case, we had a, a body, the Black uh, Pool Borough Council, who ran an airport and they put in a call, they asked for tenders to, for people to run flights to and from, um, tourist flights to and from this airport, um, to put in a sum of, um, for a certain amount of money. All right, and what happened was they said, well, we will, they, they said as part of this, we will take bids up 
until midday on the Friday, you know, Friday the 1st of whatever. And there was an error. What happened was the Blackpool and Fired Aero Club actually submitted a tender at 11 o'clock. All right, the, thing, the box got closed at 12 and there was an administration error. And so theirs didn't get included when the council was going and looking at all the tenders. So they gave it to someone else. All right, when they realized the mistake, they then tried to back out of their other contract, of the, I think it was Red Arrow Player Club or something similar like that, and rerun these offers, um, the, this tender process. Then the club, which they'd said had won, went to sue them. And so they said, oh, okay, we're canceling the second round. And so the club that followed all the rules, but there was a mistake, so they didn't get the tender, they then turned around and sued. So the, the council, look, the council made a mistake. All right, they, they made a, a clear mistake here. Um, and so the court, uh, again, the House of Laws had to go through and, and um, have, a, have a yarn about this. And this, the starting point they said, and this is important for you guys in the commercial context, is that when you are making a call for tenders, you're asking for people to bids, you are asking other people to make offers. You are not legally, legally obliged to consider those offers. Okay? You tell them that they've got it. Uh, well, it, once you've told somebody that they've got the contract, in other words, you've accepted the contract, their offer, yeah, you're bound. And this is the thing. This red arrow, red, red pull or red something or other, they had said, hey, you can't undo this. You called for tenders. You accepted us. I'm uh, sorry. Called for tenders. We made an offer. You accepted that offer. That's a contract, mate. You, you're bound. You can do whatever you like from this point. If you don't, if you want to repudiate it and say you don't want to be bound, that's fine. We'll sue you for the amount to put us in the position we would be in if you did what you said you're going to do. We don't mind doing that. Um, but this was the, the guys who, again, that suffered from the mistake. They went to sue. Now, what happened there is that they said that, look, in commercial arrangements, normally a call for tenders is not an offer. When you go out and say, hey, um, I'd like people to make an offer. Right? That's fine. There's no legal consequences to that. However, you can phrase that in such a way for there to be two contracts. And this is what um, the, the Blackpool Borough Council really stuff up, stuffed up on. Well, kind of. Government bodies generally do this. There's two contracts here. One, we're asking for offers for, um, from every, everybody. All of these area clubs, please make us an offer. That's going to be a contract if we accept it. But the other contract that they said when issuing this call for tenders, they said that we will consider all applications. So that's a separate contract. We call it a collateral contract. It's a separate one. So basically, the contract with Red, oh, I said Red Flying Company or whatever it was, that's still in force. But there was another contract, and you're in breach of that Blackpool Council because you said you would consider it. And they delivered it. They did what they had to do in order to be considered. So that separate, separate contract, we call it a collateral contract, that is what they get sued on, not the main one. The main one is still with the Red Flying Company. This extra contract that you accidentally put into this instrument when you posted it out. And this is the sort of thing for you guys, particularly if you end up doing things like marketing, and you do, um, again, it's a pretty narrow sort of an area, doing calls for tenders, asking people to come and do work for you. Just make note, if you do say, we will consider all applications, that can be construed as a separate, independent contractual obligation, capable of being sued upon separately from the main one, the main one where you're offering the things back. It just um, takes a little bit to um, get your head around there. So the guys that gave the contract to these people, yep, it was the council. Yeah, yeah, that's the other one. So they've definitely they're with the with the red. Um, so these guys can sue them. They did, yeah, absolutely. Oh, and absolutely. Yep. Yep. They're both. They're going to get so they're loose. There's, it's both ways. That's it. Again, the careful thing to note here, and I, I say this a little tongue in cheek, but also as a big bit of warning. Contract law is nasty. There, it's cold. There's no tears in contract law. You make a set of promises, the laws of ye old England 
hire you to the standard of making you do what you said you're going to do. And if you don't, and this is, again, the really important rule, we won't do until, until week four of contract, but it's a super important one, is that if you don't, you have to put the other side, I'll just finish this question, in the position they would have been in if you did what you said you're going to do. That's a massive rule. I'll get, it, I'll get it to it in the fourth week of contract and we're doing discharge. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay, so the question there is, do all of the terms of contract have to be enshrined in the instrument, in the actual document, assuming the parties intend to make it entirely enshrined, or are there some national, or also Queensland, um, statutory frameworks that sit over the top? And the answer is definitely the latter. There are definitely statutory frameworks. We, we call these implied terms, implied by statute. So for example, when you are buying and selling, um, sorry, when you're going to the supermarket, there is an implied term when you buy food, it will not kill you. And that's not, we're not expressly, when we go and buy a tin of food, we don't ask the cashier every time we do that. It's implied by statute. There's actually a statutory rule that says for consumer contracts, goods must be safe and fit for all, um, you know, all reasonable purposes as part of it. Those things are implied as part of it. For certain types of contracts, what you find is that powerful parties, when you have big mining companies and they are creating a joint venture agreement, so a contract for the two of them to work together, they are powerful entities, they have expensive legal teams, and interestingly, there are not many statutory rules that sit over the top of that and those arrangements. They're governed by the laws of ye old England, this stuff. Uh, I know it sounds a bit strange, but you can kind of see why. They've got expensive lawyers. They don't need to know. Um, we, when we go to the supermarket, we just want... Our, um, our chickpeas to not kill us. We don't need to know all of these, the minutiae of stuff um, as part of that. So yes, there are a lot of statutory frameworks answering the question that sit over the top. We do them in week, in week five of contracts, so week seven of the, of the subject. Okay, um, next thing to note, I'll just do these two and then we'll, um, uh, we'll do the next slide as well and then we'll have a break. Um, counter offers. This is an important rule of contract. It's not intuitive goes like this. If you make an offer to somebody um, of a bunch of terms, I will sell you my boat for $500. And you turn around and say, I want, I'll buy your boat, but only for $400. And I go, no. Can you then say, okay, $500 it is. Pay the $500 and take the boat. And the answer is no, actually. It's actually an interesting area of law because once you make a counter offer, in other words, you are changing some of the promises, the terms that were clear and unequivocally given to you, that actually negates the original offer. When you're offering $400, that is offering back to me. I have to accept $400 for the boat. If I choose not to, the original offer that I had is gone. Uh, so you can go, you know what, I want $600. That's right, I could do. I could do, it, could do it. That's right. I could go back and say 500 is fine. That's fine. It's up to me. But I'm not bound to. The contract has not been formed if you make a counter offer. It's actually a really important rule. Oh, it's got an old case, hide and wrench, which is a little bit complex. I'm not going to go into it. Um, but the key thing to note and look, this does, it definitely does happen. It happens in your personal life and your private life. Um, if you say, I will buy your house for $100,000, you know, sorry, well, will you sell me a house for $100,000? And they turn back and say, I'm not going, um, I'm not going to do it. Uh, sorry, if I say, I'll do it for 110 and you say no. And then they turn back and say, oh, no, 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 100 is fine. Too late. The process of you offering something different negates the original offer. Okay, that's a, it's actually a pretty important rule in commerce. Um, it's one you probably want to tuck, one of the rules from today to tuck away in the back of your brain because it, it, is, it is actually pretty important. Once you have responded, you can't go back and accept the original one. Okay, uh, this last one here, this Butler Machine uh, Tool Company, um, this can happen as well where you've got what's called standard forms. We, where one company has a standard order form 
and another company has a standard uh, sales form. In other words, this is cross offers. Yeah. This Butler and Machine Till uh, Til Limited is what's called the battle of the forms. When the seller, when the, the buyer has a set of terms that they say we wish to buy with these terms, and the seller has a, a series of standard terms that says we wish to sell, these are our terms. And both of them get signed. What happens there? It turns into something of a mess. And that's what happened here. The court had to work out which contract wins. Which contract is going to win? Um, in, this, uh, in the case of, of this one, and they said, look, it could go either way. It actually could go either way, depending on how each of the contracts is written. So if I, I have a company, and I have a standard orders policy, which says I, all orders must be, um, uh, for this amount, have to be approved by this person, all orders have to be delivered uh, based on, on, with these particular rules. Yeah. And all orders that we make of machinery can only be for machines that have a warranty period of five years, for example. Let's just say that's on my standard form. Yeah. All right? So I go to you, you sell machines, and you go, okay, cool, you want to buy a machine? Cool. Your contract for sale says all of our machines only have a one-year warranty. So I have my standard order form, which you've signed. You have your contract, which I've signed. They're in conflict. So assuming the machine breaks after four years, who wins? And it can be very, very messy in that situation. The court has to work out which contract stands. Which contract is this actually operating under? It's actually a really hard thing to do. Of course, the battle of the forms. That, and it actually depends. It actually depends in terms of how the negotiations have happened the timelines of when the things have been signed, when the contract is not really. The courts are pretty vague and they said, look, each particular instance requires you to analyze when the contract came into existence. And there they said that the offerers, in other words, the, um, the purchaser in that case, their document wasn't sufficiently complete. It needed the seller's one in order to actually put the two of them together to exist as an actual contract. Therefore, the seller's contract is going to trump the buyer's only one year. Again, it was slightly different facts of that, but essentially in that, that, that example with the, um, the one-year versus five-year, one-year contract, seller would win in that case. But, um, but the idea is, is that they are, they're separate. They're actually separate contracts, even though they can both be signed in those situations. The court has to determine which one is actually in operation. Um, Okay. All right. Very last thing. I'll just just mention these things here. Um, so if you've got an offer and you've sent it to the other side, and they don't, all of a sudden, I've sent this offer out. I don't want to do this anymore. Right? You can cancel an offer. Right? And you only have to give or make the other side aware that you don't want to be in a contract with them. You don't have to go through a great deal of formality. So if they accept it before they get notice of you wanting to um, uh, re revoke the offer, if they get notice, no contract is going to form. If they don't have notice um, of it, and you go through, um, you, you can go through and give notice ahead of time before they actually accept the contract. All right, um, and so just note, a couple of other things come up. Um, the main one here, I just want you guys, I mean, some of them are obvious, death. The death of a person offering something. If I offer something and I die before it gets accepted, usually you can't accept it. Um, there are some rules, again, statutory rules in succession law that says the executor of the estate can uphold these things, but usually it doesn't. Um, just a key thing to note though is material change in circumstances. So I offer to sell you this boat, all right, and the boat just gets destroyed. And we're all, we, we are aware that the boat gets destroyed. All right, that's going to end the offer, assuming that you've got notice of the destruction. Not notice of me revoking the offer, but notice of destruction of the boat. No. Okay? Uh, the main and most important one is time. Offers only stay open for a reasonable length of time. What does that mean? It is, uh, 
It's what 12 of your peers would think it means. Courts never define the word reasonable. They don't define it. It is what's called the objective test. It's up to the jury to work out, in criminal matters anyway. We don't usually get juries in civil matters. Um, in that situation, it's actually up for the judge looking at the facts and, um, and essentially wearing what they call the arbiter of fact, right? looking at the various facts and weighing up the evidence. Um, which sounds a little bit strange, um, but that the idea is that issues of fact go to a jury. What would a reasonable person think? What would 12 of your peers think is a reasonable length of time? Um, I'm selling my boat before, in fact, I've got it uh, as, as a real example. I was sitting during the contract law lecture last week and trying to sell an old car. I've got an old car sitting in front of my house that I haven't driven for six months. And people are offering, I put it in real estate, so people are making offers. Hey, will you take 400? I'm like, no, 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 I'll do 450 though. He's like, okay, 450. So I'm like, oh my God. I would show it to all the students, but I'd be telling them that I'm on the phone during the, during the lecture, which is a little bit naughty. Um, and, um, but the guy didn't get back to me. And so how long is it before that um, a particular offer is left open, stands. That's right. It's a reasonable length of time. What would a reasonable person think? I can't define that for you. Um, a reasonable person is different from, from an ordinary or an average person. Reasonable people don't get angry, pissed off, grumpy, suicidal, homicidal. Reasonable people don't kill people. Reasonable people would leave offers open and it would depend on the circumstances. If you're offering to buy something expensive, you expect it to be open for quite a long period of time. If it's something small and there's an available market and there's many other people want it, <laughs> rolls of toilet paper are a, are a thing in, in Australia at the moment. Um, putting an offer out to the world, rolls of toilet paper, can you accept that offer in you know, 12 months time? Probably not. It's not reasonable to accept that. Okay guys, what I'm gonna do, I'm going to, I'll leave the recording running. We're gonna go and have some water, have a bit of a break. Um, it's, it's 10 past 7. We'll rock, come back in about 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, team.
Okay, guys, I'm just going to pump up the. Uh, yeah, sure thing. No problem. Yeah, no problem. It's, it's not a. Sorry about that. Oh, work out. oh, they're the worst. They're the worst. Oh, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that you still think I have a Kiwi accent. That, uh, oh, that's so sweet. How's that? Is that a little, little bit better? I'm going to try and talk a little bit louder through there. Microphone up. How about a little bit higher? That one will be a bit much there. Go over there. How's that? And talk a little slower. Yeah, I have to admit, that is something that I um, definitely go through. Which is what we're going to do, guys. We're just, um, just in the break. Well, we can get started and then we'll, um, we're going to, go, going to go through the worksheets. Where are they? Over here. Okay. Um, a little forms. Yeah, we're just going to do, just talk about the first two. Okay. So this look because this is a master's level subject, the level of um, uh, I guess sort of thought and analysis that you guys have to go through and do is going to be a little bit higher. So it's more than me just telling you what the rule is. So the rule on counter offers is when somebody makes an offer and it gets and the, and the other side makes another offer back or changes some terms, that's a counter offer and it negates the original offer. Hey, our picture's gone. The microphone seems to be working, at least. The microphone's working. I think you'll find that on the recording, the, um, the, the audio is going to be there. But the picture's gone on, the, um, on the, the little webcam. I think I might have knocked it off. It's fine. I think we'll live. Okay. So what, um, if you just want to have a think about it, though, is the idea that a counteroffer negates the original offer is that fair? What do you guys think? Is it fair? Why? Why is it fair? It's separate. You're right. It's a separate thing. And so that it's that idea, I think also is part of that, is that when you demonstrate that you want to change something, is it, if you try and think about it, is it something that we should allow as part of this banter, this negotiation process, and give people the chance to have taxi backsies um, as part of it? Or do you think as part of negotiations that it's a stronger, um, I guess more cleaner or clinical way of doing it if, if, they, if they can't change it? Yeah, I'm, I'm genuinely interested to hear you guys' thoughts. It's, this is something where engaged with something new. You get to use your brains. You guys are all smart. Um, you know, your opinion matters here. It really does uh, as part of it. And so I'm interested, if anybody else has got any sort of thoughts on that, do we think that that's, um, do we think something, do you think it, it reduces or increases the amount of time negotiations take? You reckon? Increases because each time it's a separate offer? There's no, there's no taxi backsies. Because there's no taxi backsies, you can't quickly resolve it by going back and saying, I'll take that first offer after all. And it have enforced. Okay, it's a good point, actually. Um, but it's it's that it's that um, trying to think about the why. It's one thing for me to tell you guys the what. The what's pretty straightforward. It's the why. Why do these things exist? And I think it's a combination of all of those factors. Um, going back to that idea of risk again, putting on our financial um, accounting hats on. That that idea of trying to minimise transaction costs. A, a really important theme of contract law from the laws of you know, the, of the, the British is that they actually really emphasize people doing what they say they're going to do and sorting their problems out themselves. It's, uh, those, are, those themes, they come up a lot as part and parcel of it. Um, they don't want people to go to court. Going to court sucks. It's expensive. It's slow. You're going to have one winner and one loser. Um, it's, it's no, there's no real winners in going to court. No winners. Only the lawyers win. 
Um, and so that, that's why it's, you know, it may be um, you know, as part of this process. And look, to be frank, judges are not accountants. <laughs> I use that phrase a lot in the subject um, and when teaching tax law as well. Um, they're not accountants. They're not analyzing the underlying dynamics of transaction costs. They can't. If you think about it, judges can only examine what is put in front of them. They're usually really smart guys or girls, but they can only look at the cases and change the law based on what's put in front of them. Oh, you're going to come sit there. I need to Okay. Oh, good golly. I'm having a hard time with the mic. Maybe I'm burning death, but I don't Oh, no. Oh, you poor thing. Okay. Talking a little bit more into there. That's all good. That's all good. Okay. So, um, so that idea of true transaction costs and judges, you know, trying to make things up as they go, that only goes up to a certain point. They're not going to have the, the ability to get up off their seats and gather any data. They actually go and analyze whether or not having this rule or that rule in contract law is going to lend to a more efficient economy. That's not their job. That's the job of governments to get up and do that, to have government ministries and bureaucrats pay people to go and do that sort of data analysis and train them for those particular jobs. That's really what this, this thing's about. So these have sort of been stumbled across all of these rules over a long period of time. Okay, um, the second question, the battle of forms occurs when the seller and purchaser have standard form documents. Who do you think should win? There you go, that's, um, that's that Excello and Butler machinery case. So where you've got standard form, the seller has got a document that's been signed and the purchaser has got a document that's been signed. What do you guys think? What's fair? Should it be the first one signed? The most recent one signed. So the second one signed. Okay, so that one there. So that, um, because that, and that's, it's a good point to think about though. If it is the second one signed, so the purchaser has an instrument, um, their form, again, going back to the one year versus the five year warranty. The purchaser says, we will only buy things that have five year warranties, All right? Every person we, set, we buy from must give us five year warranties. Whereas the seller says, our products only have a one year warranty. Both of those things get signed. So if the first one gets signed, so let's say it's the, um, the purchase order form gets signed by both sides, all right? Is the act of them both signing the second form, should that negate the original one? A bit like the contractual, um, the counter offers. Maybe, maybe it should, maybe it should. Um, one of the um, kind of unfortunate things that works against that though is a rule that we'll talk about, I think next week, it's the effect of signature. Um, when you sign something, terrible rule of contract law says, <laughs> um, when you've signed something, you're deemed at law to have read it and deemed to have accepted all the contents contained within, which is a terrifying rule. If you think about the things in life you've signed without reading, and let's face it, pretty much everything we've signed in life, we haven't gone through to read all of the terms. Um, they say terms and conditions, but as we'll talk about next week, condition is a type of term. And we'll come back to that. Okay, we'll leave that for the time being. We'll move on to the next, move on to the next component. All right. So the flip side for accepting contracts is indicating that you or me, the person who's accepting the contract, intends to be bound by the things that are offered without modification. If we want to modify a term, what's that called? Uh, it is negotiation as part of it, but I just talked about it. It was hide and wrench. It's a counteroffer. If you think about it, so here's a list of terms. If I want to change one of them, I'm now the offer, offeror. You're the offeree. I'm, I'm bouncing it back at you. I'm now the offerer. That's a counteroffer. So it's without modification is a really important um, part of that. Now, you do know though that acceptance though, sometimes in a contract you can say, oh, I only want this to be accepted in a certain way. Okay, so as part of the original um, uh, instrument, I can say, look, I only want this to be accepted in writing by delivering to me before this particular date. All right, that's fine. And as the offeror, I can, um, I'm allowed to set these rules for accepting them in any way, sh shape, or form I like. I also can say this can be accepted by anyone. 
you know, that's a unilateral contract, the Kabbalah Smoke Ball Company, I can say any person that, in this case, buys my Smoke Ball product and gets the flu um, can come and claim the 100 pounds. All right, that's how you accept that particular contract. Anyone can do it. Uh, but you, you do have to note this last point. Silence can never be the accepting of a contract. Why? I can't write a contract to you that says, um, I will, or sorry, give an offer that says, I will sell you my house for $300,000. If I don't hear from you, I'll deem you to have accepted my offer. There's no meeting of minds. You can never have silence as a, as a mode of, um, uh, of accepting contracts. Now, when you go into the supermarket and you're buying goods, all right, when do the offer and acceptance occur? And is there a time delay between the two? When you, when you get the bill? Oh, yeah, kind of. It's, um, if you are the supermarket, the person selling thing at the supermarket, when's the point in time you want the contract to come into existence? When the money comes into your hand. At no stage before that, are you, as a person working in a supermarket, going to accept that a contract exists? At no stage. We say that that is contemporaneous. The contract comes into formation at the time one or both parties performs. In other words, pays. Usually it's pays. Um, sometimes it can be supply of goods. Usually it's pays. And certainly most contracts that we have in our day-to-day -day life, payment occurs at the time of formation. Does that mean the other side, again, thinking about the supermarket, still have things that they might have to do? Well, they might. For example, if there is some sort of consumer guarantee. If this um, you know, uh, tin of chickpeas turns out to be rotten, they still have to perform something here. They either replace it or they refund me. Okay, so it's that idea that my performance is done. My performance, all I had to do was pay. And the contract came into form performance at the moment I paid. And that is the moment, by the way, when pay wave, when the thing comes up saying, accepted. Accepted, accepted, payment accepted. That is when the contract, not a moment before, it is contemporaneous with the offer and acceptance. Okay, well, there we go. And that's the next, that's the next point there as well. Um, you can literally stipulate and most consumer transactions stipulate payment is the, is the way it gets accepted. Okay. Um, all right. Mobile Oil and Linda nominees is a, is a case where it involved um, petrol station franchisees. There are actually a lot of cases in contract law that involve petrol station licensees, horses, and boats. Now, the boats we can kind of understand, you know, the British, this, that, and the other thing. But a lot of cases about racehorses, for whatever reason, and a lot of cases that came in the 20th century to do with the big oil companies dealing with their franchise holders. It was a lot, for whatever reason. And, uh, this one, Mobile Oil and Lindell nominees. But this idea of partial warnings. Because what happened there is that there was, um, um, uh, I, I guess, a series of contracts where the oil company, Mobile in this case, would say, we will let you run the store using our name and buying our product exclusively um, for a period of time. All right, and what they had said, and the court said, very unfortunately, here they said that look, even if this had happened over a period of time, and when you, as the the franchisee here, Lindell nominees in this case, have your oil for sale, um, the mobile oil, you only sell mobile oil. That's part and parcel of getting the franchise. Um, the oil products and mobile petrol have the mobile brand everywhere. Um, even if you start to go and perform doing this, in other words, in this case, carrying on selling our products, that does not automatically mean that that is accepting um, an offer. In other words, in this case, an offer for you to be a franchisee and carry on doing it. So that even starting to perform does not always demonstrate that, that um, you are actually accepting the offer. Um, the, the key takeaway from this, by the way, is when you are making an offer and it matters to you, 
and this is commercial certainty, be clear about the terms and also be clear about the method of acceptance. So those things just, there's an aspect of precision. Um, and, and it's certainly something that people, well, people that have been in the legal profession over a long time will tell you that precision with language and precision with timelines matters. Matters a lot. And for most of you guys, particularly for those that end up in the accounting sort of roles, you're going to be tasked with giving advice in terms of stuff, going through contractual arrangements, looking at them, valuing them. Time and risk. These are two really important variables when you're going through and doing this analysis. So there's a takeaway from this part here. When you're offering and you're accepting offers, be crystal clear about what it is that's happening. Okay, and that competing standard forms is cross offers. That's the same from the previous one. I don't know what's there. All right, this rule, this, in fact, this slide is, um, is a thing called the postal acceptance rule. I think it is the worst rule in contract law. I hate it. I have to teach it. It's really dumb. But it flows back from Adams and Linsell, an old case, back in the day where people would have contracts and be communicating through post. It goes like this. If there is a contract capable of being accepted by post, it is deemed to be accepted when the letter accepting the offer is put into the post box, not when it's received. Say that again. If there is a contract, or in other words, an offer to create a contract that is capable of being accepted by post, the contract is deemed to come into existence when the letter accepting it is put in the post box. So if I open a tender? A tender is a call for other people to, to make offers, but yeah, tender is a little bit trickier. Usually with tenders you have, tenders are usually specified. So the question is whether you've got to call a tender, usually you specify how that is to be accepted. If it is capable of being accepted by post, sure. Please reply by post. Accepted by post? Yep. 10 p.m. 10 p.m. Oh, well, 10 p.m. as well. Well, that's right. If you put, if you clearly put, and these are common rules, you're capable of, of overriding that by agreement. But by default, if you say, please respond, or here is my offer, right? You have 28 days to respond. Okay? You don't stipulate the mode of acceptance. Post is one of those options. It is deemed to be accepted and the letter is put in the mail. I cannot stress enough how dumb that is in this day and age. And so these cases in Torres and Brekibon involved uh, telex machine and fax machines. And in those cases, uh, Lord Denning for the first one and the House of Lords, oh, Lord Diplock, I think, um, both said, this rule is old, it is a rule of expedience, it is a rule for a bygone era, it is still good law, but only for post. It does not apply to text messages, facsimiles, emails, and pretty much any other way of, of doing it. Social media, and, you know, Facebook messenger. Yeah, sure. All right, sure. Um, I say, all right, I wish to sell my, I wish to sell you my boat um, for, uh, $8,000, um, this offer is open for 28 days. Yeah. All right. On the 27th day, you write me a letter saying, I shall buy your boat, put it in the post. It's deemed to be accepted on that day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 I know. It's as and dumb as I just sounded. Yeah, yeah. It has to be accepted it's, it's accepted at the point it's put in the box. Yeah, I'm not kidding. I know, I know. What do you say? I have a hard time with this rule. This is the rule. This, this is literally the law. Change it to what? This is a good. This is what we're going to be talking about during the break. I wish to hear what you wish to change it to. I, I, I am all ears as the courts as to how to go about changing this particular rule. It sounds really dumb, and it is really dumb. So if someone sends an email or a messenger, completely different. Fax machine. No. No. Okay, this last one. No, this, this bit here. This, for electronic communications, is, is modified by statute. Okay, so this one here, um, section 24 
of the Electronic uh, Transactions Act says that a communication is deemed to be received, and in other words, you are accepting the particular contract when the reply is capable of being retrieved. What does that mean? Well, I'll think about it in the context of email. All right, you guys, most of you know how email works. We'll say that we've got, um, into, say we've got using work emails, right? So the um, at JCU, not the my, not the cloud-based ones. Come back to that. So if I'm, um, uh, if you've got um, uh, a work email, say you're working for, I don't know, the council, and I'm trying to sell you my boat, I'm at JCU, you're at the council, I'm sending an email that says, hey, do you want to buy my boat? for $8,000, okay? I type it up on my, well, say so I'm using Outlook, typing up on my client, I click send. It goes into the local mail server, the local mail server goes to the ISP, the ISP goes through the cloud to the other side's ISP, it goes into their mail server, and then it can be retrieved by a particular person when they click you know, send, uh, check emails uh, on their, we'll say we're using desktop computers here. All right, so if they, if you then go back and say, yes, I accept, click send, it goes into the local mail server, the local mail server goes to the ISP, the ISP goes through the cloud, comes to um, my ISP, and this server provider for JCU, then it goes to the local mail server, and the local mail server, I then click send receive to read the acceptance, right? Some point in that chain, you can, but it has to go through those steps. And so that at some point in that chain, Parliament has said the contract comes into existence. Which step? There you go. Go, go, class. Which of those steps does the contract? The person cannot retrieve it back because if you haven't opened or read it, the person is that what it says? It says it's going to go upon the message becoming capable of being retrieved by the operator, me in this case. In the case, the victim was fraud. Just that someone yeah. your name. Ah, oh, your fraud is tricky. Fraud is tricky. Um, there's... Because uh, the contract is valid. Yeah, the contract comes into existence at one point in that chain. Once you receive the email. What does that statute say? That's literally the law. What does this say? Read that. That's a... it's only yep. the Yes, the offeror is me. Yeah, so it's on you to you, so it yep. is accepted. When? So, is it accepted when? Because we think about that chain as I described. My mail client to the local server, the local server to the internet service provider, the provider through the cloud to the other side's provider, then to their local server, then to their client. When you treat it your ISP. Which one? When you treat it your internet service provider. It's, they actually say it's when it reaches your internal server. Because in theory, from your ISP, that, and this is again, this is, they have actually argued about this point. It's good. It's a good. It's a, it is a very valid point. They actually say it's going to be when it's in your internal system, not in your ISP system. Because in theory, there is an additional step to transmit it from your ISP to your local server, assuming that there is a local server as the go-between. So if we're retrieving directly from it, like using webmail, it's a little different. Yeah. Yeah. Sure thing. Okay. Start again. All right, you guys, when you're typing up emails in Outlook, right? Who here uses Outlook? Not through the web client. It's a little bit different with web clients. If you're on a desktop machine, say you're in the library using a desktop, does anybody use those machines anymore? Or does everyone have their own laptops? I'm not, yeah, I'm not too sure whether this, I'm not too sure whether this is this helpful to you guys. But um, when you're sending an email, it goes through a series of steps. All right, and it requires there to be systems that are managed by different entities. So, for example, if you're using webmail, that's run, it's actually done by Microsoft, uh, my.jcu, so it goes to Microsoft server, and they're the internet service provider. All right, so that if you type, if we're using, um, I'm using uh, the JCU mail, and you're using, say, I don't know, a news mail or something similar, Google mail, um, in that situation, where there's only one entity on either side, it's deemed to be accepted when it's in Google's system. Because they are the ones we're going to retrieve the thing directly from. Does that make sense? So if you, if you don't hit send receive? If you don't hit send receive, it does not matter. 
But send it's on, but it's on if it's on Google's phone. server, in that case, so assuming, oh, sorry, if you're with Google and I'm with JCU, yeah. I'm the offeror, I send the thing out, Microsoft goes through the cloud to Google, you read it, reply, say, I accept, goes back to Google, they send it through the cloud, comes back to Microsoft. When it's sitting on Microsoft's server, that is the point in time the contract comes into existence because that's what Parliament says. Um, it's not when I read it. I have to go log in. That's the law. What if your computer broke down that minute and you don't receive it? Contract exists once it's in, in this case, in Microsoft's mail system. That's just the, that is literally how that works. Um, it's capable of being retrieved by me. Oh, we've got to appreciate because sometimes it's, it's actually not the buyer and seller. It's the offer, the person who's making the offer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When he said yes, and he said the book is sent, he pressed the send button. So then we can say that in other. When you feel the offer or the person that's, that says, I wish to either buy or sell for this amount. I've stated the two terms, buying this thing, the boat, and $8,000. If it goes, I type it up in my Microsoft Mail, goes through the cloud to your Google Mail, you retrieve it, Click, okay, sure, I accept. You click accept. When it makes it from Google's mail to Microsoft's mail, once it's here, once Microsoft have it, then the contract comes into existence. The fact that I haven't read it yet is irrelevant because that's not what the law says. It's not what the statute says. Yeah. Yeah, and, and deletes it. Um, if, again, these things come down to the rules of evidence, if I can, or whoever wants the contract to be enforced, can prove that it made it into Microsoft server, and at that time, it was capable of being retrieved, because that's what it says. It's, um, these are exercise in stat interpretation. It's actually a lot, lot narrower than the basic the general rules and principles of common law, contract law. Literally, they've just written that out to give it a point in time. So for any system or series of systems where an offer and an acceptance of that offer is coming back, it's when it's capable of being retrieved by the offeror. The fact that they don't retrieve it, or at some stage later, they can't retrieve it, too bad. If at some stage it was capable of being retrieved, that's when the contract comes into existence. But sometimes I can send an email and yep. I can retrieve the email that the person hasn't read yet. Sure, but that's so different again. Remember, remember that you can also just send them an email that says, I retract my offer. You just have to give them notice that the offer you've sent, I'm retracting it before they accept it. And that's that fine. fine. That's fine. You only have to give them notice. That was the previous few slides. You only have to give notice. So if you just quickly say, oh, no, sorry, I take taxi backsies. It's fine. If, however, they've read the first one and they say accept and send it back to you, all right, and the thing ends up in your mail client before they read the next one, um, again, rules of evidence start to play in these things there. Who read which one first? But that is Parliament jumping in and saying, look, the courts don't do this very well. They really don't. They really don't. They're not judges and not judges and not IT IT guys. Okay, that's the um, uh, that's offer and acceptance. Those are the first two elements. They're usually a little bit longer than the other ones. So sorry about that. We've got about an hour to go. All right. So the next bit is the next what we call the physical element of a contract. It's called consideration. And there's a couple of things we need to note about this. Uh, consideration is something that one side or both sides are each promising to do or not do. So they say, it's very expressed in really broad terms here. Some right interest, profit or benefit accruing to one party or some forbearance, detriment, loss or responsibility given, suffered or undertaken by the other. What does that mean? Something good or something bad? You can contract for somebody to suffer some form of detriment. You can, it's fine. Um, uh, I pay you for you to, I don't know, stand in the rain for an hour. That's fine. Apparently, I get some sort of benefit from this. You suffer some detriment, but you also gain something as well. My consideration, $100. Your consideration, 
getting wet in the rain for an hour. What hell have you? It doesn't matter. Um, now, this next line here, this consideration must be sufficient but need not be adequate. There is a famous line in contract law that says, a mere peppercorn, and there's a, you know what a peppercorn is? Yeah. Like pepper that you, you grind up. There's little, little things, that little black ball things. A peppercorn is sufficient consideration. In other words, for a contract, giving somebody a peppercorn is fine. If somebody wants to pay you $10 for a peppercorn, assuming all of the other things are fine, offer acceptance, intent, contract, legal relations, and so on, and the vitiating factors we'll talk about uh, in two weeks' time, they're fine. In other words, nobody's being tricked. Nobody's being um, you know, threatened to enter into this contract. There's no other form of misrepresentation misleading. The courts, this is really important, the courts of common law do not care how fair your contract is. I cannot stress this enough. No one cares, especially not the courts of ye old England. That's right. That's right. But there is equivalent. We talk about that in equity as well because we do accept that some people do need the law's protection. Access, um, uh, the, 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 the vigilant, not the tardy. Not the diligent, not the tardy. But here, the courts in contract law do not care how fair the bargain is by default. They just don't care. Assuming that you, as two rational individuals, come together, have a meeting of minds to exchange promises, and all the elements are satisfied, if one side is getting a much better bargain than the other, too bad. Because, in theory, as two rational individuals swapping stuff, you guys have studied, most of you guys have studied economics. If we come together and we swap stuff, I do, I'm giving you something you want. You're giving me something I want. In theory, we're both better off. We've both you know, maximized our utility, assuming there's a low transaction cost. If we repeat this many times, that's what grows a healthy economy. In theory, it makes people happier. The courts don't care whether there is some objective truth about fairness. They don't care. Super important. So consideration, a mere peppercorn, is sufficient consideration. Um, all right, so that that... This idea of um, needing to have something, though, does actually have some caveats to it. Right? There are some situations where consideration doesn't count. It doesn't satisfy this element. In other words, because it doesn't satisfy it, it's not a contract. All right. Um, what we call illusory consideration. That is where you are getting... Or forbearing something that in some way um, isn't really a, something gained or something lost. So an example here um, is that if you or I, say we had uh, the, the boat, going back to Sam's boat, here's the boat, I've got a boat, you've got $8,000. You want a boat, I want $8,000, it's fine, we exchange that, all right? What if you find out later, all right, that you actually already owned the boat. Did I actually give you anything? If you're buying something you already owned? No. No. I call that illusory consideration. Um, is there, like this is, this is haphazard. It's unusual. It's unusual. Yeah, it is. Is there yep. something that we can think of? A particular that... example? Yes. Bouncing checks. Now, it doesn't happen very often, but a check is an instrument. Um, and again, has anybody here written a check out? I'm actually quite interested. Has anybody here written a check? Oh, good work, team. Well, this is more than I thought. It's certainly way more than my first years. I, um, I taught trust accounting last year. We, we, taught, we had to teach the law students how to write checks. And um, I realized when I found my old checkbook, I hadn't written a check since the 90s. I haven't written a check in 20 years. Um, so I'm a, I'm a Kiwi. We'd, We've had, we've had internet banking in FOS for a really long time. Um, but checks are an instruction to tell a bank to pay the person instructed to, on the check, essentially. Sometimes you can write out cash or you can pay any of the person handing in the check. 
It's an instrument. Now, if there's no money in the bank account that the check is trying to draw from, the bank won't pay it. It's called a bounced check. Yeah. And the law of contract says a bounced check is not valid consideration. So if, again, we had the, the, the boat, I was selling you my boat, you were giving me a check for $8,000, I go to cash the check, all right? That is not valid consideration. There is actually an important consider thing that, that flows from this. Because it's not valid consideration, well, there was no contract at any stage. What does that mean? Well, kind of. It's, a, it's actually it's a little different. If, for example, um, we had the situation where I gave you the boat and, what was, and you promised me eight thousand dollars cash, all right? But you didn't pay the cash. What do I have to do? What can I do? I can go to the courts and I have to sue you yeah. for the cash for the amount of money. All right? We'll say eight thousand dollars, but it could be more. Come back to that. If, however, you promise me a check and you write the check out and it bounces. That's a total failure of consideration. There's no contract. And most importantly, it means the title to the boat hasn't passed. So I can go to your house, find the boat, pick it up and take it away. This is one of those mechanisms that the courts of ye olde England have developed for self-help. Joel, Joshua. You pay Say a boat. Oh, Boat's good. I give you the check. Yeah. Five thousand now. I don't know the answer. Sure. Five thousand. Yep. Okay. I take the boat. I go to the passport. I change the name. Of the oh, you're yeah, assuming that there's no registration. Assuming it's like a kayak. I've got. A, I bought a kayak. Uh, Five hundred dollars. Yeah. Registration's different. Because, uh, yeah. If we the check box, then you come on pick up the boat. Yeah. Yeah. You for you know, for seeing. Yeah. Uh, those things. There's a variety yeah, of things yeah. that come up in terms of registration. If we just assume that there's no system of registration, so um. I, I did buy, I bought a kayak for five hundred dollars uh, a couple of years ago, um, and um, and so that yeah, a, there are a lot of systems for a lot of assets. So again, the car I'm trying to sell, I was tell you I was did the contract for four hundred fifty dollars by text message. Um, that has to be a general law sale because you have to transfer cars with registration using. Um, they have to have what's called a roadworthy certificate, and this car will not get a roadworthy certificate, so I have to take the plates off it and sell it as is, under the common law, using these rules and not the statutory transfer rules. Okay, so there's just a couple of things to note about that, that you can still, it's, it's still an, an asset, I'm still allowed to sell it, but I can't sell it as a vehicle that can be driven on Queensland roads. Okay, um, so there's another important um, type of consideration that's not valid, and that's, uh, that's past consideration. All right, um, why if, instead of having a boat, if I have a contract for you to come and, and oh, I, I, yeah, well, you're in Australia now, you're gonna come and mow my lawns. Because that's, uh, it's Australia, we all mow our own lawns usually. It's, it's crazy when you work out how, what the wages are here, it's insane. Um, but for those that have yet had the, the joy of, of mowing lawns in Australia and Queensland in the middle of summer, I feel the pain you're gonna have one day. Um, but say, come into my lawns for $100. That's fine. All right, I'm going to come mow your lawns. You're going to give me $100. No dramas. That's easy. All right, what if though, we've been friends for a while. I mowed your lawns last week and you come to me and say, oh, I'll give you $100 for mowing my lawns. Now, I'd already mowed your lawns and I did it because oh, I'm just a swell guy and we've been friends for so long. Okay. Can you sue me in contract law? The answer is no. Why? Because consideration has already passed. Past consideration is not good consideration. All right. And so that, that Again, um, sorry. past consideration is not good consideration. And an example of this um, is the case here, Stilkin Merrick, this, this second one here. Um, it goes like this. Stilkin Merrick is one of many cases involving boats. In this case, it was a, um, a crew that was going from, I think, Mumbai, and they were going back to Portsmouth in England. And they stopped in South Africa. 
And when they got off the boat, half the crew deserted. You guys know what I mean by deserted? They're just like, stuff, they don't want to do this anymore. They just disappeared. And so what the captain said was that, oh, look, I know we've already got a contract with you guys to go from Mumbai through to Portsmouth. But you know what? Well, um, we'll pay you a little bit extra now, okay? Because of all these people that have deserted, right? No worries. We'll just we promise that we'll we'll pay just that little bit more if you don't desert, okay? So what happened? This guy made it all the way back to Portsmouth and said, "Where's my money?" And they said, "Ah, oh, nah." And do you know who won? The shipping company. Why? Because the guy had already signed a contract. Contract was, you will be a shipman from Mumbai to Portsmouth for this amount of money. All right, that is the duty you are already under. You cannot change that. In other words, take the fulfillment of an existing contractual duty, use that as consideration for a new contract. In other words, I can't say, oh, the duty that I'm already under, I'll keep doing that if you pay me more money. No. Nah. Common law doesn't let you do that. It is not good consideration if you're already under contractual duty. Now, a couple of people would jump on this and say, hey, what? hang on, what's the problem here? What, how could they have resolved this? They could have ended the contract in South Africa, created a new one. They could have done that and it would have been fine. Hey, we don't want you to desert. How about we end this now Promise to pay you this amount of money and we'll pay you this amount of money when you get to Portsmouth. Is that a deal? Yes. Okay. New, the parties have agreed to discharge this contract and create a new one. That would be fine. But they didn't do that. They just said, we'll pay you more money Was if it you. A contract, a contract? Uh, I mean, yes or no. It actually doesn't matter. So it even does... if they created an extra contract, yep. that we will pay you this much money if you make it to. If, this is the thing. If you make it. In, the consideration for that extra contract is to keep doing what you were already contractually bound to do. So that wouldn't have worked. If you're writing two contracts and one is still in existence, and if, you didn't cancel it, the in, first well, one kind of. There's a particular thing. This is to do with consideration. If consideration for that second contract is for you to do what you promised to do in the first contract, that is not valid consideration. You can't create a second contract in common law by using a pre-existing contractual duty. And you have to finish one contract the same party. And then you have to finish That's right. They could have done that by terminating that one at that time and creating a new one, but they didn't do that. That wasn't how it was construed. It was just, we'll pay you more money if you do what you were already contracted to do. And the courts in Ye Old England said, actually, that's not a contract. Not good consideration. You didn't give anything. You're just doing what you're already bound to do. It's not a contract. They're not obliged to pay you. Um, it's quite unfair, actually. There's a bunch of these cases that involve in crewmen. Um, there's an awful one on Cutter and Powell that we'll do in a couple of weeks' time. Um, yeah, they're really awful because the shipping companies win. So they gave them the money because the point agreed or they did not give They were going to pay them at the end. Pay them at the end. I mean, they do give usually, um, the way it works in boats historically is that you get a little bit and um, oh, get rations, you get things a little bit, but it's largely paid at the end. Um, and so that's why they said, oh, we're going to pay you this extra bit at the end, and they didn't. Um, okay, all right. Um, however, just going back to this idea of the mowing of the lawns, if there was an understanding when I mowed your lawns that I would be remunerated, but we didn't fix a dollar amount, that is okay as consideration. We contemplated that I would be remunerated, but didn't fix the dollar amount. That will be okay at common law. Um, so just make note. If I just did it because we're just good friends, I just mowed your lawn, then afterwards you offered to pay me, and then later I said, oh, yeah, sure, and then you didn't pay me, no contract. If, however, when I first mowed the lawns, it was agreed, even though if it wasn't, strictly speaking, a contract, we agreed that I would be getting something out of it later, that's okay. We've contemplated this at the time I've done the action. The courts are happy with that but not if I just did it ex gratia. That's past consideration. It's a little bit tricky. Some of these things are tricky to get your head around. Um, and even trickier is this one. Trickier. What's the last one I got?
Okay. I'll do this slide and then we'll take a break again. And then we'll, we're probably going to finish early, actually, than usual. Okay. So, this is our first exposure to the area of law known as equity. Equity remedies defects in the common law. What does that mean? Sometimes the courts are really harsh. Look, they don't care whether people are stupid in terms of making their agreements. But sometimes, some situations require the courts to actually use a separate set of principles in order to prevent an injustice. And in Australia, it's always in circumstances that are what's called unconscionable. If it is unconscionable for one side to receive some sort of benefit at the detriment of another, courts will intervene to prevent an injustice. Okay. Um, and this comes from a, a, a case just after the Second World War, um, uh, the High Trees case, Central London, London Property Trust and High Trees House. Um, that involved a rent agreement during the war where um, you could imagine, this is London during the Blitz, it's getting bombed, like this. And so there were rental agreements that were in place. And um, the courts, uh, oh, sorry, the parties had agreed, hey, look, there is a rental control thing in place. If you stay in, at the end of this, I'll compensate you. All right, at the end of this, if you stay and use these things for until the end of the war, I will um, compensate you with, with some sort of uh, reduced rent or some offset. And, all right, but strictly speaking, you're not offering any consideration as part of this bargain, the common law anyway. You're not promising to do anything. Why? Because you're under a pre-existing obligation to pay, even though the whole place is being bombed. Okay, so that you're under a contractual obligation. Hey, if you carry on um, you know, doing this, um, we will reduce your rent, and at the end of the war, we'll balance this out. At the end of the war, of course, came, they reneged on the agreement. They didn't want to do it. And there the court said that, look, in a, spe a specific set of circumstances, the courts will intervene to prevent an injustice. If these three things happen, that is where one person actually materially alters, in other words, usually suffers some sort of detriment as a result of acting on this particular promise. And we can't undo it. So one side's actually usually suffered dollars and we can't bring those dollars back. And in some ways, it's unfair or unjust. Now, in Australia, we use the term unconscionable. This is a UK case. We use the term as unconscionable. Um, there's a technical definition for this, but we won't do it for two more weeks. Um, for the promiser to renege on this agreement. Now, it's actually better explained. High trees is where this principle comes from. But it's actually better explained in this Walton Stores case. Um, why? It's an Australian case, a high court case from the 80s, I think. Yeah, and it goes like this. Um, Walton Stores owned a whole bunch of malls. And they got Mayer. Um, they had, had some contractual negotiations with Mayer for them to come and do some developments on one of them. All right, so they had all this, kind of this content all ready to go. And Mayer started working on it. And they started developing, knocking the, the buildings, existing buildings down, leveling the thing, expending money going through and doing this. Now, at some stage in this process, Walton's realized that the planning regime wasn't complied with. It was neither party's fault, neither party was aware of this, but it actually meant that you couldn't have a contract. You couldn't have a contract to do this particular development work. They became aware of this, all right, but they owned the land and they were very happy for these guys to carry on building the develop, doing the development, building the car park, building the building. They didn't tell them. Didn't tell them. Just kept quiet for six weeks. Just let them carry on, spending their money, sending all their workers out and building these guys the building. And then six weeks later, they're like, oh, actually, um, sorry about this. Um, the statutory rule actually forbids um, us from this from being a contract. We're not going to pay you. What do you reckon? 
Should the courts intervene? Well, yeah. yeah, they should. But strictly speaking, the letter of the law says there's no contract. And so this case, again, it went to the High Court. What happened then? Or well, then they said, look, and they uh, built about, basically they took the High Trees case, they analysed it, and they adapted it to the Australian circumstances. And particularly the word they use is unconscionable. It's as, in bad conscience, if you can't hand on heart say that for those six weeks' time you were letting somebody else come in and do work knowing that they were going to do it and you weren't going to have to pay anything, that is bad conscience. Yeah. All right? Knowing that a contract cannot be formed here. Um, and so that, in those circumstances, the courts will intervene to prevent an injustice. In other words, in this case, you're going to have to pay them a fair and reasonable amount. Oh, that probably sounds awesome. Um, in order to compensate them from that time and effort. So that, that is equity intervening. Now we have to be careful. Again, I'll go back to the principles of equity several times throughout um, over the next five weeks because equity will only intervene in certain circumstances. And usually the most important one is if you're not trying to screw the other party over as well. Equity is not going to intervene if you, well, they say go to the, the courts with unclean hands. So just leave that on the back of your mind. If you think you're going to do a dodgy on somebody and you won't be able to claim in this area. If it turns out, you know, there was no contract for whatever reason. So there's some rules. Okay. Um, Commonwealth and Verwayan was actually the Commonwealth themselves saying, oh, if you bring an action, in this case for a personal injury, it's not a, not a contract law case, but it's an equity case. Um, if you're relying on a statutory right and you lead the other side to believe that you will not rely on your statutory right to do or for you know to get out of a particular contract, the courts will intervene in that situation. Um, Verwayan was a an officer aboard a um, I think he was on the USS oh, the ship named Voyager I think it was USS I say USS that's the starship that's the Star Trek ship no it was I think it was called the Voyager but it was the Australian one so. M, uh, Her Majesty's HMAS Voyager. It crashed into, um, it's actually an aircraft carrier. Um, Australia had an aircraft carrier after the war. They had a big crash in the boat in the middle of the night. Hundreds of people got killed. Um, I think it happened in the 50s or 60s, really a long, long, long time ago. And what the Commonwealth government said, government, not parliament, government, back in the 70s, I think it was, said, ah, oh, Normally these things are a statute bar, there's a time limit to bring a claim. But in this case, we'll, we'll let that go because you know, it's an unusual situation and it's military and we care about our defence force and stuff. What happened? The government changed and then later on came to the 80s and they're like, oh no, we're not going to do that, you're out of time, sorry. And so the, this went to the High Court in 1990 and they said that, look, in that situation, government has actually made a promise to not use their strict statutory rights and equity will intervene to prevent an injustice in that situation. So this guy got up and was able to bring that action. Okay. Uh, oh, actually, I'll do one more. One more, then we'll take a break. Because this is the last one on this is the last one on consideration. There is a statutory mechanism uh, for bypassing consideration. It's known as a deed. So you can have a contract with somebody where they offer nothing if and only if it is signed, sealed, and delivered following a very formal process known as a deed. A deed will bypass consideration. So you can still use the rules of contract law if you put it in a deed. It's actually very common, by the way, when you have um, litigation. Both sides will enter into a deed because they could be signed separately of each other if you don't trust the other side. The deed will say, we will forbear all rights to sue the other side. If you pay us a certain number of money, I'll enter into a deed that says, I won't sue you. Just in terms of time frames, usually what they do, rather than have a simple contract, they put it in what's called a solemn document, a solemn deed. Um, and it just lets you bypass consideration. So you can have a one-way contract, essentially. Why would you do that? Oh, there's a variety of places. Um, I've listed some of them down there where um, you're, you're basically forgoing a particular right and you might not be getting something out of it. Um, 
So things, um, yeah, indemnity, indemnity, in other words. If I just want to give up my right to sue, all right, but I'm not getting anything out of it. Maybe money's going to a third party or I'm just doing it out of the goodness of my heart, but the other side wants the projection of contract law. This is the way to do it. You can do it in a deed. Okay, um, I don't really have too much to say about that. So what we're going to do, we're going to take another short break and then we're going to come back and do these tasks. These tasks here. So have a little look. Oh, so hopefully we can talk about now. Can't do homogenous. But we will talk about the postal acceptance rule, stuff on the back. I'll come back to homogenous in a little bit. Okay. All right, thanks.
Okay, guys, we'll kick off with this stuff. Um, from before, we talked about the postal acceptance rule. And uh, people, <laughs> some people in the class, including me, said that this is really silly. Um, but what should it be? What should it be? What's, what's a better system? What is a better system than that rule? Go. What is a better system? Than the postal acceptance rule. If we had to think about the postal acceptance rule, I'll, I'll bring, the, um, bring the slide back up. This idea, which one? It is the worst one. It's a, it's a terrible rule, I think. But is it the best of a bad situation? In other words, what would you have if you didn't have the postal acceptance rule? So if somebody's got a contract, all right, I'll sell you my boat. If you get back to me, you can accept this offer is open. You can respond, reply any way you like within 28 days. Okay? 
What do we reckon? If you have a letter which is posted, what day should it need to be posted on to be accepted by post? Should you have to? Registered post? Should all contracts be registered post? Because registered post is different. Registered post, you have to sign it. You know when a letter is received, or a registered post, it has to be signed for. That's why when you serve papers on people, you use registered post. Because you're guaranteed that somebody with that signature has picked up those documents. Um, so that's, that's a different system. Maybe that's what you could do. And say, hey, this rule no longer exists. The parliament could do that. They could say, no contracts can be accepted by post other than registered post, for example. All right? Parliament doesn't usually do things like that because it may have unintended consequences. Things that, but I personally, I don't know. What, what, do, you guys, what do you guys think? Going back to the, um, the rule as it stands at the moment, if you leave a contract open, say for tw 28 days, and the person posts a reply on the 27th, even if it's not received for another five days, Right, it's still deemed to have been received on the 27th. That can have some real consequences because after on the 29th day, I might have just gone and sold it to someone else. Now I'm in breach because you accepted that deal on the 27th because that's how this rule works. Um, what do you think? How could you fix this law? If you're given the power, Abishai, how would you fix this? Just leave it the way it is and hope that people never ever send or do contracts by post, maybe? Because it's not uncommon for people to not specify how contracts are to be accepted. And because this is still on the books, this is still a law. Um, it doesn't come up very often, thankfully. Uh, but you know, the post can do some weird things. And um, I, um, <laughs> I love telling the story. When you start to put statutory rules, parliament jumps in, parliament can do some weird things as well. You guys may find, living in North Queensland, um, I don't know if you've, many of you guys spend much time in Brisbane or in the southeast at all, because I had a great one. I got a, um, a letter from, the, uh, from SPUR, which is the State Penalties Enforcement Register, involving something that I hadn't paid. Didn't pay something. So they cancelled my licence. And I called them up and said, hang on, I've just got this letter today. This says, my license is, you know, surely this can't be right. Because it says, 14 days after the date of this letter, if you haven't paid, your license will be cancelled. All right? Doesn't sound that problematic. 14 days is quite a lot of time. Seems fine, right? Well, the date of the letter was the 7th of May. It was posted on the 19th of May from Brisbane, and that was a Friday. You see a problem here? And I went back and read the statute. Turns out the statute said the date of the letter. 14 days from the date of the letter. So that's when we stop to think about people going in, Parliament going in, and making a rule. Because that sounds fair, doesn't it? You've got 14 days from the date of this letter to pay. Does that oblige the department to post it that same day? Not at all. They took 12 days to post it. And it was a Friday, and it was posted from Brisbane. So I didn't receive it till the Tuesday. And my license had already been suspended for a couple of days. All right, so in theory, I was driving unlawfully. And if I'd been stopped, I would have been booked. Uh, no one said you that. Well, it's strict liability. I'm blamed. I was driving without a license. Yeah. Strict liability offences. Yeah, it's a little bit scary. And I went back and read, that's how it's drafted. So that's why we have to be careful. When we're going and putting these sorts of rules in. Um, Parliament has to be careful because you know, they've mapped things out well. Um, and because a lot of the time they don't. Who here has had to deal with the Ministry of Immigration, uh, what's it called these days? Immigration and Border Control or whatever they've changed. They change their name every few years. Um, reading the Migration Act or the Family Law Act or the Social Security legislation the amount of changes that, that those legislations have, that those statutes have, is just insane. It's crazy, crazy upon crazy, where they've done something, not realised the inadvertent consequence of it, and then had to go and change it. 
Um, I think I mentioned just recently, I, I signed um, freedom of information request. I had to fill in a form and get a lawyer to sign it. So I got a lawyer to sign it and sent it off. That lawyer was me and they wouldn't accept it. And I said, well, strictly speaking, you have to because that was the way your statute was drafted. If you don't like it, go and change it. Um, anyway, that's the downside of parliament is stepping in. Okay. Question. Yeah. Um, these papers. Yes. Okay. Yep. Do we have them answered for answer? There's no answers for this. There's, that's for you guys to go through and do. These are high level questions um, that tie in with your discussion board questions as well, some of them. It is for you guys to go through and actually take not just the rules you're going to learn, but to actually think about it and construct what you genuinely think arguments for and against doing things. It's not, some of these things aren't right. There's better or worse arguments. Ah, so there's no right or wrong. Not really, no. Not really stuff. This is you guys analyzing stuff. You can create better or worse arguments. You can create poor arguments. I think the postal acceptance rule is good law. Uh, sorry, is good law because um, I support the Collingwood Football Club. That's a bad argument because it makes no sense. Yeah. All right, but you could have other reasons which are far more sophisticated that you can put in and go through and do that. The reason for that is that um, your examination is going to require you guys to think a little bit more. Um, that you said, but we have a multi-choice test for this. The test is pretty easy. Um, and next week I'm going to be doing a session with the externals. And so the internals, you guys as well will have a session. We'll go over the test and what you need to know. And I'll go over each of the questions. I would expect that most of you guys that have turned up to class and paid attention and read the books and gone over the slides will ace this test. You'll do, you should do quite well. I'd be surprised. If, um, yeah, it's, yep. Sure. In Australia, in the common room, do we have any like public D? Public D? Public D? Public D? The, the, do we have a notary, for example? Oh, yes, yes, yes. We call them a notary, a notary public in Australia, in the state of Queensland, is called a justice of the peace. Uh, okay. Justice of the peace. That's the, um, that's the thing. That was the, um, it's called a justice of the peace. I, um, when we do misrepresentation, I have a story about me trying to become a justice of the peace. It's very silly, but very, very apt for this subject, but that's two weeks time. Okay, all right, so the next bit here, should the rule for acceptance in electronic communications be merged with the postal acceptance rule? In other words, should this somehow become the postal acceptance rule? Could the postal acceptance rule, in other words, this idea that uh, something is deemed to have been accepted when the thing goes in the post, the person accepting the offer puts the thing in the post, could it be merged with this rule here somehow? And again, have a think about that. And what I suggest you do, I think so too, I think you can, but you could do it, um, again, going back to this idea of registered post. Registered post requires a person to sign for it at the, at the far end. And in this day and age, it's become far more common for people to do that and have that expectation. It's possible that judges could just dispense of that, of the postal service rule altogether and say, literally, you should have used registered post. Yeah. It's possible that they could do that. Again, I'm not, it's not a right or wrong answer. Do you guys know what I mean by registered post in Australia? It's an Australian English term, unfortunately. It's um, a special type of a letter you send. It costs $7 to send one letter um, where the letter must be delivered to somebody and they have to sign for it to say that they've accepted it. Um, that's, it's quite common in, in legal circles because we use it when we're suing other people because we need to prove to the court that they have had notice of the documents. Um, so it costs, I think, I think $7. Um, it's a good extra security check as well because you know where your Signed envelope is. Yes. Yeah, yes. but you still haven't read the letter, right? Not relevant. Same thing. Yes, that's right. But remember, well, oh, sorry. When um, usually... The courts are only concerned that people could have received it, not that they actually have received it. Oh. That's really what the courts and parliament has mapped this out here. It's actually not about whether people actually do things, it's whether they could have. It's like giving people the opportunity. If somebody gives me papers, like serves me papers, I got served papers yesterday, which was awesome. Somebody serves them and says, here, I'm suing you now, and they just drop it at my feet, and I go, oh, no, no, I don't want to know anything about it. The courts aren't going to let me get away with it. They're going to say, no, no, mate, you knew the papers were there. 
That's right. And signing, also because the signing involves identification, you have to produce ID when you sign for it. Um, look, it's not perfect, but it's a much better system than the old one in theory. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Okay. A um, couple more. A um, couple more rules. Move on with the slides here. Uh, what do we got? Capacity. Uh, capacity is a bit of a tricky one. Um, the main problem with capacity is not so much. Um, oh, I have a look here. Oh no. Oh, good gracious. I don't know why I haven't got it here. Um, I've lost a slide somewhere. I'm a little bit worried about that because there's one important rule about yeah, capacity. Ah, there we go. I thought so. I was thinking to what minus. Sorry about that. All right, I'll come back to this one. Um, the, the previous one, um, capacity, the, usually the problem we have in contract law um, is with... Oh, a couple of types of peoples that um, can have difficulties with capacity. And that, those are minors. What's a minor? Under 18. Under 18. Um, was, uh, it was actually different in all the jurisdictions until a couple of years ago in Australia. Now, in all states and territories, it's 18 for the criminal law and the civil law, thankfully. All right. Why is that a problem in Townsville? Because a lot of youth crime, they can't judge them, they can't do anything. Um, you, I don't know if you're aware, in, um, I told my nine-year-old, actually I told him a year ago when he was eight, that he couldn't be held criminally responsible for any crime whatsoever. And his eyes lit up when I told him that. Really? Some law should be given to Ah, yeah, yeah, should keep it quiet. But the parents can be responsible for Sometimes. The parents, not usually for the criminal matters, all right? That's hard to do unless they're somehow conspiring to, them to do it. Sometimes they can be held civilly responsible for the actions of your, of your child. You can be held responsible for the actions of, of your child. Do you think something but, should be done about such laws if it's causing death to people and stuff like that? Again, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's, um, it's one of these things. The, um, the rules on minority, though, actually flow from international agreements as well as domestic ones. And you appreciate that different countries, when trying to protect the rights of children, look, we don't want... Nine-year-olds to go to prison. That's a really bad society when for whatever reason nine-year-olds can go to jail. It sounds, something about it just feels inherently wrong. And there are treaties that Australia has signed up to um, that says the rights of the children are X, Y, and Z. So you don't okay. have juvenile uh, prison? Sort of. What they do up at Clevedon, they do have juvenile detention, right? So from 11-year-olds onwards can go to juvie. But by default, it's quite hard for them to do. They have to be really bad, like really, really, really bad. Um, like somebody under the age of fourteen, they have to be essentially this, that, that level of that level of problem. There's one of the minor in Townsville. Yep. He comes, he enters your home, he yep. takes a picture with you, yep. and then he keeps it on the side table and then he goes away. Oh, yeah, yeah, those people do that. They do also. There's all sorts what of terrible things. Oh, little they guys. Take a picture with you. Yeah. Like you're sleeping in your room. Yeah. So they sneak in and do it. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, they do. Yeah, that's like that. People, um, young kids, kids, kids do that. Yeah, that's a thing. Um, you yeah, find that, yeah. My friend just for fun. Yeah, just for fun. Yeah, there it is. This, I, this, I can absolutely attest to that. Oh, I'd slap them. Oh, well, if you're awake. Um, yeah. Well, you, um, well, it's a difficult thing. Um, I, I'm a Kiwi, all right. I, I grew up in South Auckland, all right, in a, a couple, about two or three years ago. I'm the only person that's had a car stolen from JCU in like the last three years, right? And I laughed my head off. It was so funny. Why? Because I've, I've grown up in South Auckland. I've had cars broken into um, 15 times. This is the 16th time, first time in Australia. And, I, and people are saying the crime rate's so high. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not the crime rate is not here at all, and I thought it was hilarious. So the girls in the office, they're all in tears, and I'm. I also found it hilarious because a couple of days later at Hyde Park, someone found my car, and we're there waiting for the police to arrive. And then these dudes just arrived with a, a spare battery. The battery was missing from it, and they got this battery and my stolen car key, and they were assembling the car. And so me and my friends are like, um, "Hi, 
<laughs> I mean, just as the police arrived, it was hilarious, absolutely hilarious. So I got my car back, cleaned and filled with petrol. I got my, literally got my car back in a better condition than when I, it got stolen. It was crazy. But but, it was recently an accident. It was crazy, sorry. A and a child died because just a minor was yeah, doing what that's it. So what we find here is that the crime, the, the reason why I bring this story up, crime here is quite different to what it is for me as a Kiwi. In New Zealand, crime works completely differently. I don't understand how crime works here. There's just the youth crime and young kids using these sorts of rules because they know they're acting rationally. They're acting rationally. And I've got to say, I have a lot of friends who work in the youth prison. Uh, five of my friends work there. And those kids have a much, much better life in prison than they do outside. They, they, get, they literally get fed three times a day. They get exercised. They're not getting molested. They're not getting beaten. Um, they don't want to leave. If you think about it, they don't want to leave. That's a problem. That's a problem when you've got 14-year-olds that would much rather be in prison. So as a society, again, I'll, this is a question in philosophy and chronology, not, for, um, not so much for business law, but that's something to, um, that you have to think about when being heavy-handed in terms of the criminal justice system. Um, it's hard. We appreciate that kids don't work the same as us as adults. They don't have the same mind. They don't, in the case of contracts, they don't have the same amount of capacity to have this meeting of minds, like two rational individuals coming together. So what we say is that contracts can be enforced by the minor, but not against them. So by default, if you sell, again, selling my boat, $8,000, I hate it, it's just the, the person in front of me. Sorry, sorry about that. You get picked, picked. She got picked on, now you get picked on now. $8,000 with a boat. Um, if, I, if I'm selling the boat and you're a minor, all right, you can enforce the contract and say, yes, I will uphold this, assuming that you paid the money and I haven't given you the boat. You can go to court and say, there is a contract, all right? But if I've given you the boat and you haven't paid the money, I can't enforce that against you. Now, it's not to say I can't get some remedy in another area of law, but I'm not getting a remedy in contract law, okay? I can't enforce that contract in the court against a minor with two... Um, exceptions. There are two types of contracts that can be enforced and those are up there. It's for the necessities of life and beneficial contracts for service. What does that mean? If you are 16 years old, can you buy food at the supermarket? Yeah. Yes, that contract can be enforced by both parties. Can you get a job? Yeah. Yes, and that you can do that job and it can be enforced by both parties. Those areas can be enforced by both sides. Okay. Both sides, they're mutually enforceable. Um, other contracts can't be. And interestingly, we, I remember 10 years ago when I studied, or 10, 12 years ago, when I studied contract law for JCU, we talked about whether mobile phones are a necessity of life. It turns out, more recent cases, yes, yes, it actually are. For Telstra and Optus and people like that, they have to take that into account when they're selling to them. Um, to minors, that it actually that it can be a contract with a minor. You can enforce that. Okay, that's the, um, I guess, the main part of capacity. There are some other ones, though. A um, couple of things to note. By default, um, intoxication. So getting boost won't save you. By default, it usually doesn't. Sorry, can you go back? Yeah, sure. One question. Yeah, sure. sure, sure. So the last one is... Takes a few seconds, though. So. Yeah, so those two, so basically, normally contract for something like a boat or a pair of roller skates or a trip to the Caribbean, those are not necessities of life and they're not beneficial contracts of service, they cannot be enforced. Yeah. So that if you give something to a minor and expect money, tough luck. Those two types of contracts can be. So this one here, beneficial contracts of a oh, job. Oh, first one. Necessities of life. Yeah. Oh, if, um, yeah, if I'm, um, if I'm a food vendor, if you've got, you're a 17 year old, so you're a minor, and I supply you with, <laughs> it's fun in Australia, 
20 boxes of toilet paper. <laughs> don't know why it's a thing at the moment. And uh, I give them to you. We've got a contract. You're going to do this and you're going to pay me in two days' time. You don't pay me? Can I go to court? Yes. Why? Normally, with a minor, I can't enforce that in the courts. So if, it, in fact, it was 20 boxes of Lego and I gave them to you and you're going to pay me in two days' time, cannot enforce it in the courts. 20 boxes of toilet paper, 20 bags of rice, things that are the necessities of life. It's, um, an iPhone, <laughs> apparently. It's apparently, it's, it's relatively new, yeah. Um, but um, a motor vehicle. Um, can be as well because there's yeah. an aspect of doing things in life. So there's only one thing that you can enforce on a minor, well, two. which is necessity of life. This one here as well. Beneficial contracts for service. Um, that is when they have a job. So that if you pay them... Yeah, it's, a, it's basically... The two things that people, minors need to do, yeah. Um, rental agreements can be enforced against them as well. So that if they come and you pay them right, ahead of time and they don't come and work, you can sue them. Cancel them, yeah. That's, um, that's uh, the, the, the requisite capacity is there. Just to be careful with little shit. Little shit. Oh, God, that's in the recorder. <laughs> Thanks. So it has to should come to the city. They can rob you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they can. Okay. Um, a couple of other things, though. Particular business circumstances. Um, by the, if you get drunk and buy your friend's car, too bad. That's the default rule. Is the default rule. Look, the courts are a little iffy about this one because you can turn around with intoxication and say, oh, I didn't understand what I was doing. I lacked some of the other elements, the intention to create legal relations, or I, had, um, uh, I couldn't understand the subject matter, the mutuality and the intention elements. So those two um, you know, can be iffy as well. All right, so th those two you do have to be mindful of. Um, but by default, if you get booze, too bad. Um, the same with being mentally ill. Mental, mental disability won't get you out of a contract. Contract's pretty harsh. They're pretty hard in terms of, in terms of that aspect of all that liability. Um, there are a couple of things that come up though, um, and that is with unincorporated societies. Now, you guys are aware of there are these things called companies, right? A company is registered in Australia under the Corporations Act, pay a fee, and it is a separate body. It can sue and be sued, it can own property, it is standing in the eyes of the law, it's a legal person. Right? But as well as companies under the Corporations Act, you can have incorporated bodies under other legislation. So for example, um, are any of you guys familiar with the term body corporate? Body corporate in a building? Like if you have an apartment block, you live in a big apartment block, there is, under the strata title legislation, a committee of people who run the building. Yeah. All right? and they levy all of the people, all right? and they are allowed to do that under statute, and that body corporate is a legal entity. It's a person who can sue, can own property, and can sue and be sued. Um, and another example of this are incorporated societies. So the Townsville Chess Club Incorporated, the James Cook University Student Association, and some of the clubs at JCU. The JCU Business Society is incorporated, has been for about five years. The JCU Law Student Society has been incorporated since the 80s. All right? These are separate legal entities. They can own property, they have bank accounts, they have people that run them. All right? But you can also have a society, which is a bunch of people that haven't done that process. It's just a bunch of people who have come together to form a club, all right, and if it looks like an association, and they're acting like an association, but it's not, a contract is gonna bind all of the members. So if you're in an organization, if you join a chess club, or you join a poker club, or you join a comedy troupe, and it's not incorporated, be warned, a contract that, that somebody's making in the name of that club will actually bind all of the, um, uh, of the people on that committee. So just leave that one in the back of your mind, which often is all of the people, by the way, in small societies. Okay, so you can have a company, right? You write a company, and a company is a separate legal entity. And agents of the company, so employees and directors, can bind the company in contract. We actually spend a whole week on this. It's called agency law. If you have an 
unincorporated society. So in other words, it looks like it. So for example, in this room here, if we say, all right, hey guys, let's form a club. Um, we'll call it the JCU Kite Flying Club. And we say that we're a club, but we don't actually go and incorporate to create a separate legal entity. We just call ourselves a club, all right? And we go and get a bank account. And one person then goes and spends all of the money or goes and enters into a contract. And somebody then goes to sue the club finds out that it's actually an unincorporated society, all the people involved in that can be sued. That's, it can be a, just a, that's a bit of a gotcha as part of that. Um, so usually, said, usually it's the, the committee, the people on it, but in, in small groups, that's going to be everyone. Okay, um, bankrupts. Again, we do bankruptcy later on. Um, certain contracts, when you're bankrupt, you can't do a whole bunch of stuff. You're not allowed to. Bankrupts can't um, engage in certain um, types of contracts. There we go, prohibited contracts. These ones here, they talk about this. Um, but the other side can choose. So the trustee who's looking after that person's stuff can choose to uphold the contract or not. If you're silly enough to make a contract with a bankrupt, by default, they don't have legal capacity to enter into those contracts. Okay, how many for time? Ooh. Yeah. Which one? Which one? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, I might just... What if they form what you call legally formed... Yep, yep. How are they going to... If once it's a legally formed incorporated entity under the Queensland legislation, that is the entity that, sued and, and that can be sued. When that runs out of money, the members are fine. Members, committee members are fine. They're not... That's right, that's how that works. It's the same with corporations. If you're acting honestly and reasonably, as a corporate director, right, and the company just loses money, you haven't done anything reckless, you haven't breached any duties, the company just ran out of money, too bad. People lose out uh, when companies go into liquidation. Okay, um, uh, next element, mutuality. Parties have, you've got to understand what the subject is. This is an element of a contract. It's also a vitiating factor we'll talk about when we talk about mistake. Um, so there, there can be situations where the things are, are ambiguous and the parties do not know what is happening. By and large, if the court can look at it objectively, in other words, they look at it, what a reasonable person would think the parties were trying to contract with, not what they actually thought. So the court comes in as an independent third party. What would a reasonable person think when looking at this contract, think that the subject matter was? In situations where the parties, usually they're mistaken about some aspect of it. Um, so that's... Uh, the situation we use this, uh, the example of the objective test. It's a reasonable person test. Because if the parties don't mutually understand the subject, I thought I was buying your, the red Honda that you had parked in front of your house, but it was actually the red Honda that you had parked behind your house. I thought I was buying a good car, you thought I was buying a bad car. We, we say that we're mistaken. We didn't have mutual understanding of the contract. There is no contract. I'll come back, back to this one again. Um, only because we're quite short on time here. Um, I'm missing a slide. Oh dear. Can't believe I'm missing a slide. Okay, that's annoying. Okay, um, so this is not the last slide. I'm, for whatever reason, I am definitely missing a slide from my, um, from my PowerPoint, so I'm really, really sad about it. The last slide the of ADR. Yeah, yeah, I've, just, I've looked at that and I've realized that that, I will have to correct that. I'm really sorry. That, um, that I've, there is an extra slide which shouldn't be in there and it's, I'm definitely, definitely missing one slide. Because you might have noticed, this is the final slide or the final proper slide but we've missed one. I haven't talked about one of the elements, which is intention. Okay. Intention. I will talk about, we're going to um, do this one here. I'll, I'll have to send you guys a link to it. I've actually just written it up in a, um, uh, in a separate link, which is really annoying. But contracts on the face of it must be lawful. In other words, you can't have contracts where the subject is fundamentally against 
common law principles, principles of policy, or um, or forbidden under statute. And we, I'll go over this in a lot more depth when we're doing the vitiating factors as well. But note that there is a distinction between contracts, again, that are legal on the surface of it, but are illegal as performed. And the courts do not like finding contracts illegal as formed. They don't like doing it. They basically, the, there's this long-standing theme in the courts of common law that they will bend over backwards to try and uphold contracts. They don't like breaking them. They don't like doing it readily. They will try to interpret them in such a way so the sides that have clearly come together to form a contract, that contract is in place. We will use the rules of non-performance and discharge to work out what happens next. Because in situations where there isn't a contract, the law is a little bit messy in terms of what happens. So going back to, the, to us with the boat, if there was no, um, I've given you the boat, you haven't paid me the $8,000, you're 17 years old, how do we resolve this is actually a little bit problematic because you've got to use other areas of law, um, usually tort law, in order to recover property. It's not done under contract law. You can't use the rules for breach, uh, which are well mapped out and quite mathematical. Other areas of law are a little bit trickier than that. Um, and I'm, we're out of time here. Um, it's nine o'clock now. Um, I'm going to have to go and find that last slide. We basically go this. I'm just going to go through and just tell you what, um, what you need to know. Um, intention to create legal relations as an element is about the parties actually having um, the desire for this to be enforced at law. The two parties have to have this. And the default rule, the old rule in common law was if it was a commercial relationship, the intention element is satisfied. If, however, it's a family relationship, it is not satisfied. That is the old rule. In the case is a Balfa and Balfa, to B A L F O U R and Balfa, and Jones and Padavarden. And, and um, those situations, they involve one involved husband and wife, another involved a woman um, paying her niece, I think it was, to come and give up her studies and go and look after her. In those situations, they said that, look, by default, family relationships, not a contract. It's a commercial relationship. By default, it is a contract. But they are what's called rebuttable presumptions. In other words, you can go to court and say, look, sure, this contract I had with my brother-in-law, yeah, he's a family member, but it was a commercial arm's length transaction. I was buying three machines off him, for the use in my machinery business, he sells machines, that's his business. This is a commercial transaction. Um, Your Honor, we would like that, rebut that um, presumption to be rebutted, all right, as a result. But the person bringing the action has to do that. Um, kind of unfortunately, the Australian High Court, in a case called- Sorry, just Yeah, sure. Sorry, so just to clarify. Yep. If, you, if it's a commercial transaction, by default, yeah. the intention element is satisfied. Tick the box. It's going to be satisfied if it's a commercial relationship. Yep. And then if it's, if it's a family... By default, it's not satisfied. No contract. If you have a bet with your younger brother for him to go and... Do, have a contract? Well, again, it's not a contract. It, it doesn't satisfy one of those seven elements. Intention to create legal relations is one of the seven elements. By default, if it's a family member, it is not a contract. So brothers can't do... Well, contract. kind of. It's, it's what's called a rebuttable presumption. What that means is that the person seeking for it to be a contract needs to go to court and convince the judge that in this particular circumstance, we did intend for this to have legal consequences. When I made this bet with my brother, Your Honor, we did want... That, that sounds silly, but... Oh, I bet does sound silly. My sister and I, we 
buying, a, buying the boat, for example, going back over here, if you're my sister, I'm your brother, I've sold you my boat for $8,000, you haven't paid me the $8,000, by default, it's not a contract, I got no remedy in contract law. Isn't it? <laughs> what would it be? What would it be deemed? What, oh no, the writing can't work in because what happened actually is that it's a presumption that can be rebutted. One of the ways you can do that is to actually look: Did we actually go and enshrine this in a document that says we intend for this to be le have legal consequences? That's a good piece of evidence to rebut the presumption and say, actually, Your Honour, yes, we know normally this family relationship thing would mean this is not a contract. But in this particular circumstance, I've got this information, um, this piece of evidence that says it actually is. All right? I can, I'm rebutting the presumption. And what the court said in Imogenus, they actually said, look, Imogenus and the Greek Orthodox Church of South Australia case, it's a high court case, 2002, they said, look, this presumption actually doesn't even work in Australia. It doesn't work at all. And it's a little iffy area of law because that's what the high court said. But all of the subsequent cases have just ignored it. They've basically just said, that's nice. It's nice and all that you don't think this is a presumption, but the presumption works very well. Family relationships by default. How would this be construed at law? As a gift. I'm giving the boat to my sister because that's what people do when they're brothers and sisters. They give each other $8,000 boats, clearly. Maybe, maybe they do, maybe they're not. And that the High Court was saying, look, really it's a question of degree. If I gave you a toy boat, a $100 boat, all right, clearly that's going to be construed as a gift. Well, again, coming back to the, the point down here, it's not determinative. In other words, it's not going to absolutely make it a contract, but it does tend towards arguing that it is that the parties did intend for this to be an arm's length transaction. What are some other things that the, thing the courts might look at? to try and work out whether or not we actually intended this real contract. What things? What yeah, that, that is, although that said, sometimes we're not disagreeing about what we said. It's this. We look at what the amounts were. We look at the history of the parties. Do I habitually give you $8,000 boats? If I don't, and it's a very, very valuable thing to me, I'm poor povo as, and I needed the cash, all of these things would be bits of evidence I would go up to the court and say, Your Honour, I intended for this to be a party, uh, for a, an actual contract. Um, can you please uphold this? All right. I, but I have to go, and again, the old rule says that I have to rebut a presumption. The homogenous case says I just have to produce a bunch of evidence. It's not a strict, have, I have to do this. It's just they're going to look at all of the evidence and work out, based on all of the evidence, is there a contract or isn't there a contract? Because it gets murky when you've got relationships that aren't, you know, like your second cousin. I mean, how many of you know all of your second cousins? I couldn't name any of mine. And, you know, and you're having, a, sometimes you could have a relationship with somebody, a commercial relationship, I'm selling him this machinery, then you find out that we're actually related. You know, these things, that, and so that's what the High Court said, that look, it's not a strict rule, all right? The English courts say that it is. If we're a family member, it's a rebuttable presumption. If we're not, um, then it's, if it's a commercial relationship, it is, but it, that's, the Australian court says it's just a continuum. Okay, that's the key thing that we have uh, about intent. Because, you know, I'm going to fix that slide and plop it up, and I'll send you guys a link to something I've written for the other class. So I hope that was useful. I hope that was useful. And I'll stop the recording now. Um, yeah.